in the present day system who just is we are krishna here who is an icon of the judiciary have become a judge of the supreme court at all and the second judges case they go with seniority and second judges says one judge says seniority is very relevant because he is in the line of succession another judge who is not in the line of succession but says there is seniority and he puts the reasoning legitimate expectation yeah judge of the high court to have a legitimate expectation to become a supreme court judge therefore constitutional the preamble first you get the word justice political etc economic etc etc justice play is primordial if that has to be hold the balance you have to hold the balance then we require independent judges only if the judges are independent the institution will be independent only if that institution is independent then the bar will be independent and only if the bar is independent the bar and the bench being the two wings of the bird of justice the bird justice will fly high up in the air and i to be said been paid to the great judges they were sent to the supreme court of course my favorite has always been subara the great judge great dissenter the great judge for protection of the citizen among the members of the bar parasan various others have gone but there is one member of the madras ma for whose presence of mind I have great admiration i'm not quite sure about his name but palkhi wala told him he was addressing the court and his trousers slipped so we all thought my god what was going to happen nothing he just took his gown across him put his foot on the table that happened at 12:45 he went on till 1 o'clock and that's presence of mind Raja Gopal Shastri I think he's one of your greatest lawyers I'm extremely happy to welcome all of you on behalf of the School of Law at Shastra University and the Times of India for the second edition of Logical Connect on the topic Uniform Civil Code Constitutional Politics and judicial will and some of the faces are familiar because i saw most of you during the last year's edition of logical connect and i did confess last year that the qualification that i have to propose this welcome address is not because i am a trained lawyer but i am a trained reasonable litigant but nothing has changed Unfortunately the bar council of india doesn't have any rules for designating somebody as a senior litigant so i stand before you as a litigant but one thing that i share with all of you is that i am a concerned citizen concerned as to why the desire of the first prime minister of our country who just waited for an appropriate time for the uniform civil code to be put in place has not happened has not manifested by the political dispensation because the spirit of the constitutionalism which gives the authority very much provides the space for that and additionally the supreme court has also expressed its mood in the famous shabanu and sarlam rudula case but just fell short of directing the government to have the uniform civil code constrained by article 44 and the supreme court has done its job in the true words of justice patanjali shastri that the supreme court is the sentinel on the qvi justice shri kt thomas for whom i have very high regard and this is the second time i am sharing a platform with him in chennai i am very happy and proud and justice ap shah the chairman of the 20th law commission and uh, about whom whatever has been said and i will add to that he is one of the persons whom the supreme court missed and it is the misfortune of the supreme court and when i say it i mean it and mr krishnamani who bears a rare resemblance to me and many people take him for me and take me for him 
but he is a very innocent and good man so <laughs> that marks the difference between the two of us and mr manish tiwari a face which is known to everyone i told him people may not know your name but they know you so i am extremely happy that in this panel which is erudite experienced wisdom driven that you will have a debate of a kind which was witnessed when adi shankara and vandana mishra debated you know the rules of debate is that no one should get angry and the man who gets angry is the man defeated that is the rule of debate which was set you know when adi shankara and mandana mishra debated the issue the issue keep it keep aside the issue the result of it is if mandana mishra won adi shankara should marry and lead a normal householder's life and if adi shankara won mandana mishra should cease to be a householder and should accept sanyasa and who was the judge the judge who was so sen- chosen was the wife of mandana mishra she is to decide whether her husband would remain her husband or would become a sanyasi you know what she did she is put a fresh garland around adi shankara and mandana mishra and said the person in whose body the heat develops the flower would lose its freshness and she said whosoever loses will be the person whose garland loses its freshness that means the person gets angry anger is a sign of defeat you know this is the rule of debate and i am sure with this august audience in their presence a panel of this kind will promote this kind of debate which is needed for a tempestuous topic like this mr gurumurthy rightly said that we shared platforms earlier but he did not know that even thereafter even day before yesterday i was in touch with him without his knowledge as i read this latest article i don't miss a single article of him because whenever i read his article i felt that had i missed the article i would have been more ignorant than what he presented i came here from my hometown kottayam it was easy for me to reach here but now i feel that it is not that easy to go back because i have to carry <laughs> the memento which is not only invaluable but weighty also <laughs> only advantage the only solace i have is that my wife knows how to play that and therefore therefore it would be a very very befitting memento to be passed over to her gurumurthy wanted a change of the terminology of uniform civil code into common civil code i very much appreciate only today i i learned the difference between the two though earlier i thought that there is not much difference but it is a misfortune of the nation that even 64 years after the constitution mandated that this shall be brought we have to conduct a debate even today it is a real misfortune i quote only thomas jefferson where there is no law there is anarchy and at least in two areas there is no law one area is uniform law for succession and marriage and second is the unguided and the unbridled privileges and immunities enjoyed by the members of the parliament and also members of the legislature mr krishna mani was 
making a very passionate plea for prohibition. And I was reminded of the words of the former Prime Minister of Great Britain, uh, Winston Churchill, who once asked about his uh, inebriation habits, said that uh, I have taken more out of whiskey than whiskey has taken out of me. <laughs> so therefore, you know, as long as uh, we stop it at the Uniform Civil Code, I'm pretty fine with that. But if we move it on to prohibition, you know, I'm afraid you'll be really transgressing into very personal turf as someone who loves his drink in the evening. You know, I do not approve of the Gujarat model at all. Secularism, as I look at it, The audience are requested to either switch off their mobile phones or have them in silent mode. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Kiran N, a fourth year law student at School of Law Shastra University. And I'm elated to take you through the proceedings of the third Logical Connect, brought to you by School of Law at Shastra University in association with Times of India. In an invocation, the macrocosm floods the con consciousness. Let us begin this wonderful evening with an invocation, a euphorious rendition by the Hindu Sarigama MS Subalakshmi Award winner and Raj TV Swarna Sangeet winner, Ashwit Narayan, who is also a 2013 graduate of Shastra University. Maitri Bhajat Akhil Hrijetri Maitri Bhajat Akhil Hrijetri Maitri Bhajat Akhil Hrijetri Atma Vadev Paranapi Pashyat Atma Vadev Paranapi Pashyat Yuddham Tyajat Spardham Tyajat त्यजत परेश्व क्रममा क्रमणम् त्यजत परेश्व क्रममा क्रमणम् मैत्रीम भजत अखिल हृजेत्रीम जननी पृथ्वी का मधुगास्ते जननी पृथ्वी काम दुगास्ते जन को देवा सकल दयालु हो जन को देवा सकल दयालु हो दामियत दत दयद्वम जनता दामियत दत दयद्वम जनता श्रेयो भूयात सकल जनानाम श्रेयो भूयात सकल जनानाम श्रेयो भूयात सकल जनानाम श्रेयो भूयात सकल जनानाम Thank you, Ashwat. I now have the pleasure of inviting Dr. S. Vaidya Subramaniam, Dean Planning and Development, Shastra University, to welcome the gathering.
don't worry, I am not black money. I will come whenever I am called for. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm extremely happy to be a part of this evening's proceedings. And before I begin, distinguished speakers, sitting judges of the Madras High Court, members of the bar, invitees, a very good evening to all of you. Before I get into the formal mode of welcoming the gathering here, I thought I will first uh, set right uh, by way of clarification on three things and all three of them products of certain adverse inferences that have been made or possibly could be made later. The first is probably I share the feeling of many of the members in the audience here. Most of you sitting on the other side would always have yearned for an occasion to come to the stage here and stand before the mic. And one biggest reason, and especially in a place like this, is to probably render, render a musical note. So before you make any such adverse inference that I'm going to sing or play a piece, uh, let me confess that I have no knowledge of music, except that I'm a good audience on the other side. The second issue is an adverse inference that was already made by one of the members of the audience when they walked in. I told them I was in the US uh, two weeks back driving from Washington DC to New Jersey and told them I crossed the state of Delaware. And then he looked at me and said, Delaware? And then you're conducting logical connect on black money? Then I was surprised. Then I recollected one of my friend's expansion of Delaware. And that's the place where you see dollars, euros are laundered and washed at reasonable expenses. That's uh, Delaware. So I told him, you know, I just passed through the state for an alumni meeting and I had nothing to do and no work at the state of Delaware. The third thing, probably because of an editorial piece in a national newspaper last week uh, that talked about the National Institute for Public Finance and Policy, which, which in its estimate stated that you know, the extent of black money is close to 75% of our country's GDP. And educational institutions are one of the significant contributors uh, because of their admissions policy. I can't speak for all the educational institutions, but I can speak with great conviction on behalf of Shastra University that we stand out because of our admission policy, which is very transparent and we don't collect even a single rupee as capitation fee. And hence, we don't belong to that category and we don't contribute to the black money. Now, having clarified on these three issues, ladies and gentlemen, I'm extremely happy to welcome all of you to this third edition of Logical Connect on the topic black money, singular agenda, multiple dimensions on behalf of the School of Law at Shastra University and Times of India. You see, when we began thinking of the topic for this logical connect, the thought process behind was very simple, that we need to maintain and continue the tradition of choosing a topic for logical connect, which has always been the tradition to choose a topic that is very close to the common citizenry of India. And today, a common man is caught, he's caught between, he's sandwiched between, on one hand, with no knowledge of what is actually a fair estimate of the black money both outside India and inside India. And on the other hand, the complexities that constrain various governments in their policy making as a result of which there is extreme policy burden for them to really act and bring the black money. And this has been the case for the last uh, so many decades. So sandwiched between these two extremes is a common man who is endlessly waiting to know when the black money will come to our country. And the wait will continue probably. Hopefully not. And that's why when I met Justice Sri Krishna in a marriage in Bombay, he told me, I got an invitation from Shastra University and I was wondering what this university is doing, whether you are offering courses in astrology. And then I had to explain, I told him that we are an engineering law university. But on hindsight, 
it also makes sense but we are also offering courses on astrology and i think this course will really be a good choice to know actually when the black money will come because a little bit of astrology is also required <laughs> but it's not a simple thing as we think it is an issue that is confronted with multiple dimensions and that is why we have carefully chosen a panel as distinguished as this to deliberate on this topic of black money and i'm sure the choice of this panel couldn't have been better at all and that's one of the reasons ladies and gentlemen i request you to put your hands together and welcome this distinguished panel to chennai i'm sure this panel will give you an intellectual fireworks diwali season is just approaching but that's a season of you know sound and light but this one this intellectual firework is going to be of substance and might substance which will physically manifest in the intellectualism that they will be displaying in a few moments from now and then you will realize the might of black money that could propel india to be a global economic power if we get the extent of black money that we are talking about back to our country so this is the hope that the entire audience here in chennai await from this distinguished panel a spirit of positivity as to what ails the system what is the actual estimate of the black money which is again you know a riddle it's a mystery what could be could be the solutions how are other countries handling this issue are we do are we going in the right direction a lot of questions seeking a lot of answers from this distinguished panel and i'm sure continuing the tradition i don't know by sentiment or by whatever reasons logical connect the first edition of logical connect was on the judicial appointment commission bill and we saw the law getting settled last week right or wrong people are debating but the law is settled the second one was on the uniform civil code and the supreme court a few weeks back has made an observation and wanted to know the direction the policy plan for putting this uniform civil code in place so my mind tells me that whenever a topic is chosen for logical connect there seems to be some solution coming up and it it is with that hope that i welcome this gathering i welcome all the members of the audience hoping that when i deliver the welcome address for the fourth edition of logical collect there will be some solution for this monster called black money with that hope i welcome all of you for this evening's grand occasion thank you very much As a token of appreciation, we would like to honor the distinguished speakers with a traditional memento that symbolizes the temple city of Tanjore and its educational edifice, Shastra University. May I now request Professor R. Sethu Raman, Vice Chancellor of Shastra University, to present a memento to Justice Sri B. N. Krishna. again i request professor r sethu raman to present a memento to shri gopal subramanian sir thank you sir may i now request Mr Anand Murthy Vice President of Times of India to deliver the uh, sorry to present the memento to Shri S Gurumurthy
Again, I request Mr. Anand Murthy to hand over the memento to Sri N. Venkatraman. Thank you, sir. May I now request Dr. Ravishekar Raju, Head School of Law, Shastra University, to hand over the memento to Sri Pogus Kaka. Again, I request Dr. Ravishekar Raju to hand over the memento to Professor Arun Kumar. Thank you, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, the much awaited moment has come to unfold the third edition of Logical Connect. May I now request the moderator, the academic erudite on black economy, Professor Arun Kumar, to lay down the context and moderate this intellectual panel discussion on the topic, black money, singular agenda, multiple dimensions. Over to you, sir. Thank you for inviting me here in your midst, fellow panelists, distinguished members of the audience. I'd like to begin by thanking Shastra University and Times of India for inviting me to this uh, discussion. <coughs> this topic is such that I feel in the panel there are people who know more than what I know, but nonetheless, I'll try and present an overview of the subject, which could possibly form the background to the discussion, and also raise certain questions, which may get answered in the process. Uh, is there a, uh, okay, it's come. So I have a PowerPoint presentation, which I'll present. It's not moving. Next slide, if, if there's somebody operating it. Uh, okay, it's come. So what I'm presenting is based on my book, The Black Economy in India, which had come out in 1999, and The Indian Economy Since Independence, which came out in 2013. And the reason why this topic has suddenly become very important is because of the agitations that started in 2011, and the variety of promises that have been made by the governments that have come. Uh, in terms of the size, as the opening remarks mentioned, it's close to 67 to 70% of the GDP, according to an IPFP study. And according to the study that we have done, it's coming to around 62% of GDP currently, which means that current rates of uh, market GDP, it would be roughly of the order of about 75 lakh crores of rupees. So we're talking about huge sums of money. Now, in terms of definition, Basically, what we've been arguing is that wherever there's illegality involved in economic activity, it results in black income generation. So law is a very important component of that. The point that comes out, therefore, is that the black economy affects all the macroeconomic and microeconomic variables. Whether it be the issue of planning, whether it be the issue of macro variables like output, savings, investment, exports, imports, all of them are affected. Similarly, in terms of micro variables, whether it be education, health, drinking water, and other such things, it affects the, uh, you know, these variables. And I have characterized the black economy in terms of two aspects. One I call digging holes and filling holes. So what is digging holes and filling holes? During the daytime, you set one person to dig a hole. At night, you set another person to fill the hole. So next morning, you have zero output, but two incomes have been earned. So there's activity without productivity, and it lowers the product productivity of your investment. And that has an a serious implication for the growth of the economy. The second is, the usual is the unusual, and the unusual is the usual. Which means, that which should happen does not happen, that which should not happen keeps happening, and therefore the citizen gets alienated from society, because whatever should happen is not happening. 
So in the taps, you should get clean water, but you don't, so all of us carry bottled water. You know, you should get 220 volt electricity, but you'll get 270 or 170. Your equipment will burn out, so you need additional equipment, so additional capital costs have to be incurred. But the main point is that the citizen gets alienated because what the citizen thinks should happen does not happen. Okay, so there is a missed development associated with the uh, black economy. And what I have shown is, in this graph, the next graph I will show you, uh, that we are missing out 5% rate of growth since the mid-70s. So the economy is going along the lower blue graph, whereas if it had the black economy had not been there, it would have been going along the pink graph. So today the economy would have been 7 times larger than what it is. And therefore the economy would have been uh, roughly about $14 trillion dollars rather than the $2 trillion, and our per capita income instead of being $1,500 would have been $10,500. So in other words, the missed development associated with the black economy is huge, and therefore we need to worry about this. There's another impact of that, which is that the environment gets degraded in the economy, and that has health implications, especially for the poor. Another implication is that the trust in society is lost. People don't trust each other. And as a result, there are additional costs. So this makes the economy a high-cost economy and therefore lowers the productivity of the economy. So we cannot understand the Indian economy if we don't understand the black economy. That's the argument I've been making. Now, if the black economy is as large as it is, it has to be systematic and systemic. It's not anecdotal. It's not that one day it happens, the next day it doesn't happen. It keeps happening. And this is only possible if there's a triad consisting of the corrupt businessman, the corrupt politician, and the corrupt executive. This is what I call the triad. This triad is what underlies the working of the black economy. And it is in this context that B.V. Kumar's book in 1990, B.V. Kumar was the customs intelligence chief, and he argued... It's not moving. B.V. Kumar argued that criminals entered the nexus from 1983 and that is what has led to growing criminalization in society because either the businessman is a criminal or the politician is a criminal. So what has happened is that the black economy has impacted our legislature and the executive and that's why there is non-implementation of the laws and the rules of the country. And it's in this context that I'd like to point out that there is a massive flight of capital from the economy. Our estimate is between 1948 and by 2012, the country has lost about $2 trillion worth of opportunity cost of the uh, amount that has gone abroad. So, this flight of capital means that instead of investment taking place in the economy, it's taking place outside. Therefore, instead of the development taking place here, it's taking place outside. But the point is that only 10% of the black incomes generated annually are going abroad. 90% remains here. That's our estimate. So, if 90% is remaining here, then we have to try and tackle it here rather than tackle it abroad. Secondly, of the money that has gone about, about 30% is round trip back into the country through the Mauritius route and other routes. So what is left outside is not the full amount that has gone abroad. Secondly, the amount of money that has gone abroad is also consumed, it's also invested. So what is in liquid form is a very small part of the money that has gone abroad, which may be available to be brought back. But also the problem that arises for the money that has gone abroad is that it goes out through a process of layering. There are 90 tax havens in the world and money when it moves out goes to one tax haven, a second tax haven and third and finally goes to the sixth tax haven which could be Switzerland or Cayman Island or what have you. And there the money has been coming from the preceding one therefore it is not counted as Indian money. That's why when Switzerland is asked how much of Indian money is lying there, they say 14,000 crores because the money may have moved from Cayman Island or Jersey Island or some other island. And that's why it's called British money. The largest amount of money deposited in Swiss bank accounts is from Britain because they own the largest number of tax havens. So therefore, the Indian money, which has gone through a round-tripping process, cannot be identified directly in that way. So it has to be, the problem has to be tackled here in India. Okay, 
So this triad is formed during the election process. I interviewed 14 members of parliament who were successful in the 1998 election. I got their actual election expenditure data and where they sourced it. And I found that the triad was formed precisely during that process of election. So it's not that huge sums of black money are used in elections. Our estimate was only 0.2% of GDP was used in the election of 1998. But the triad formation, which runs the black economy, takes place during elections, and that's the importance of that. So basically what's happened is, it's going in the opposite direction. Next one. So laws on paper differ from laws as they are in practice. And my argument is we cannot have a perfect law, because a law requires both letter and spirit. And when the spirit is weak, then any law can be circumvented. And that's why we keep having more and more laws, but that doesn't prevent the black economy from growing. And it has grown from 4 to 5% of GDP in 1955, 56, to the present around 60 to 70% that is being estimated now. So you can see various cases. For instance, section 12, six cases, which should be sorted out in six months. They take five years, six years. Uh, section uh, 138 cases of check bouncing which should be sorted out in a few months time they may take many years so even cases which can be tackled very quickly do not get tackled and I'll give the example of Madoff's case and Raju's case Madoff's case uh, took place in the US a 50 billion dollar Ponzi scheme and in six months he was behind bars at the same time Raju's case started in India it's a two billion dollar scam but that the judgment is about to come or will come soon uh, similarly, there's the case of Birkenfeld and Hassan Ali, both 2007. Birkenfeld's case is the one in which UBS was fined uh, $780 million and uh, they had to reveal 4,500 names of those who had uh, uh, bank accounts there. So that started at the same time as Hassan Ali's case. Birkenfeld, uh, the UBS was fined, Birkenfeld was uh, 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 fined, etc. But what has happened in India is that Hassan Ali case is still pending. It's not come to any resolution. So in other words, what I find is that there's a problem of not shortage of judges, but shortage of judgments. Judgments don't come. So that's why there's a huge pendency of cases, and that's why we feel that there's a shortage of judges. But I think if judgments came quicker, then the shortage of judges would not be there. Second is that there is a nexus between the judges and the lawyers, and that could be one reason for delay. And I think that those who are in the judicial system, they will know more about it and will enlighten us more. Now, Next, uh, remedies that have not worked. Huh? So we've had at least 40 committees and commissions that have gone into different aspects of the black economy since 1947. And they've suggested thousands and thousands of things. Like for instance, Banchu committee has suggested lots of things. Dagli committee has suggested. LK Jha committee has suggested. One, uh, the, the, uh, uh, you know, Santanam committee in 64 has suggested. And hundreds of things have been implemented. For instance, the voluntary disclosure scheme has been implemented six times. We've lowered the tax rate from 97.5% in 1971 to the present 30%. Controls have been reduced greatly after 1991. FERA is gone, MRTP is gone, small scale reservation is gone, etc., etc. But the black economy continues to grow. And the reason is that the political will is missing. Because this triad which runs the black economy, there the political will is very essential. Without the political will, uh, nothing will move. Next. So I'll come to what may work. And the problem is that the leadership has a very feudal mindset today. And parties are like properties. So one generation passes on the party to the next generation, whether it be in Kashmir, or whether it be in the center, or whether it be in Orissa, or other places, we have examples. So if those people are running the parties, they're not democratic, then democracy is not going to thrive. And it's the weakness of democracy which ultimately results in the problem of generation of black income and its perpetuation. So what we need is accountability. And the question is how to build accountability into the system. And the other point is that there's a fine line be between legality and illegality. What is legal at one point becomes illegal at another point, and what is illegal at one point becomes legal at another point. And this allows play to take place, and the powerful people use their intention to actually do it. So the challenge before the legal fraternity, the last slide piece, is how can the act be cleaned up, and how to prevent delays in the judicial system? And how can accountability be built into the entire system and the public? And today, justice is becoming high cost. 
how can that be lowered and made fair and so that justice becomes accessible to all and here there's a, another point that very impo important is how to establish trust in society trust is missing and as long as trust is missing things will not work laws will not work courts will not be able to function and we can see in the case of njac the recent one there's lack of trust between the judiciary and the other wings and as long as that mistrust is there things are not going to work out and i'll close with the bali ramayan the bali ramayan is one in which it is enacted by the, uh, men in check lungis black and white that means the good and evil coexist ram uh, shoots the arrow uh, rama falls down but the next moment he gets up he brushes himself and starts fighting so unlike in the our ramayan where we defeat evil once and for all there the good and evil keep fighting for all, all times and that is what is there in society thank you very much for your patience Okay, uh, the next speaker, uh, speaker is uh, Professor, uh, is Justice Sri Krishna. <laughs> Professor Arun, Arun Kumar, <clears throat> Mr. Venkat Raman, Mr. Gurumurthy, Gopal Subramanyam, and Mr. Poras Kaka, and dear friends, I was a lawyer till I became a judge, so I ceased to be a lawyer. I was a judge till I ceased to be a judge. So today I am neither a lawyer nor a judge. I will talk like an ordinary citizen. I will not talk like the experts on the dais here. Now please consider, as an ordinary citizen, <coughs> wherever you go, you are confronted with this question of corruption. Corruption, like the breeding ground for mosquitoes. Corruption is the water, stagnant water from which black money grows. What is black money? Black money is that income or asset which has been kept away from the legal uh, aspects of taxation and for disclosure that is necessary under law. Why does that happen? It happens Professor Arun Kumar talked of Bali, Rama and I think we, we will talk of Mahabharata. What does Mahabharata tell us? Najatuka Mahakama Nam Upabhoge Nashamyati Habisha Krishna Vartmeva Bhoga Eva Bhivardhate. He says your greed is not assuaged by acquisition of things. The more you acquire, the more does your greed for things improve. So ultimately it becomes a question of where are you going to draw the line? Where are you going to draw, draw the line as to what your income should be? These committees, commissions dealing with black money, corruption is nothing new. I remember when I was a young man, young boy actually, way back in the 50s, we used to hear of Gulzari Nandanda heading the Sadachar committee, which some of us used to call it as the Sadachor committee. Now that committee was appointed by no less a person than Pandit Nehru as Prime Minister to go into the aspects of honesty among citizenry. Way back in 1950s also, there were dishonest people. So in 2015, there were dishonest people and there are only chores, not apart from Sada chores, there is nothing unusual about it. I have a very mischievous suggestion. What are we talking about? I want to install a telephone. Now what do I do? I want it urgently. So I, I am asked to pay something called Tatkal fees, which is some 20,000 or 30,000. I want a reservation in a, in a train. I am supposed to pay some extraordinary amount. I want passport urgently, some extraordinary amount. Now this is exactly what happens when you go to a public uh, office for a public service. You want something to be done urgently. The man sitting behind the desk knows that you want this urgency and he takes advantage of it and says, 
हमको कितना पैसा मिलेगा नाउ दिस इज एग्जैक्टली वॉट इज हैपनिंग इन सोसाइटी सो आई से वाई डोंट वी नेशनलाइज द होल सिस्टम टेल इच पर्सन ओ यू आर गोइंग टू द सेक्रेटेरियट चीफ सेक्रेटरी हैज टू बी ब्राइड एक्स अमाउंट deputy secretary has to be bribed by the opponent pun has to be bribed such and such an amount so honestly if you tell them this is the dishonest bribe that you want then at least a man who wants to in, um, carry on his business will say well i will have to incorporate this and factor this into my cost and work it out and transmit it to uh, as indirect tax to all the citizens that is one way of looking at it and in any case as a bag used to say that there are two types of dishonest people the dishonest dishonest person is the person who takes your money and does not do your work and the honest dishonest person who will take your money and do your work it is said that during the british regime you had to bribe a public official for doing something that we have not his work some doing something that is against the law now you have to bribe a life a public official to do something which is his duty which is bound to do for you and do something that is absolutely necessary in law so what have we reduced ourselves ourselves have we have reduced into a corrupt society now i heard ram jethmalani on so many occasions talking of black money lying there as it if it is sanjeevini parvata that hanuman is going to bring it and back into india nothing like that is ever going to happen talk of why is there that money lying there in switzerland or cayman islands or jersey island or wherever else it is lying there because we have allowed it to come out of the economy here and permitted people to whisk it away because they don't want people to notice it here so first charity and corruption always begin at home so let us stop this corruption at home how do you stop corruption at home we already have the prevention of corruption act yes we have we are long on laws but short on implementation that is the greatest thing in our country we have laws for everything that you do from sneezing to coughing but we do not know how to enforce it now enforce what you have honestly fearlessly then i'm sure some results will show if not today at least down the line 10 years in line we have examples of what happened in hong kong what happened in indonesia what happened in other south eastern countries south asian countries now have we ever thought of appointing a commission to along those lines hong i remember having read a, a book written by a very senior police officer in hong kong as to what hong kong was then what it is today i have had interaction with people in singapore who say what singapore was then and what it is today now that can come about only if from children who instill into their minds that excessive greed for money is an evil now if you instill it successfully during the formative years when they grow up this this will not drive them into areas where they try to make supplement their incomes by dishonest means I remember my father used to tell me from Bhartrihari one shloka. It is, and this I tell people wherever I go, particularly students when I address them, they ask me this question and say, "Sir, you tell me all all kinds of things. What about income? What about money? Is it not necessary?" To that, the answer is what Bhartrihari gave back in the fourth century BC. He says, "If you do something." without going to be going a begging to a dishonest person without causing hurt to another person without de- uh, affecting the interest of another person and without deviating from the path of rectitude whatever little you earn is more than enough for you that is exactly that that i am advocating and that is exactly the lesson that should be transmitted to the uh, younger children in their formative years if you do not do that any amount of black money act any amount of white money act or anything in between is not going to solve the problem why is it that we are not able to do it we are not able to do it as professor arun kumar rightly said there is a vested interest in continuing the black economy the politicians want it the bureaucracy wants it 
and the leaders want it. There is no political will to curb this evil. In fact, they do not recognize it as an evil. They recognize it as an opportunity. It is opportunity for them to make money, spend money, and generate more money. I remember <coughs> some time ago, when a distinguished Chief Justice of the Bombay High Court was trying to build a house in Delhi, he appointed an architect and the architect submitted the plans to the Delhi Development Authority for approval. The, uh, the engineer or whoever concerned, the officer, looked at it, worked out the cost and said, I must be paid X percentage of this. So the architect was shocked. Hey, do you know this is the building of the Chief Justice of the Bombay High Court? So that man said something which, was, which made sense to him. He said, Udhar Chief Justice ka kaayda kaayda chalta hai, idhar mera kaayda chalta hai. Unka kaayda udhar hai, mera kaayda idhar This is exactly what has happened. You go anywhere, you are confronted with this, what am I going to get out of this? I remember once I was traveling from Bombay to Delhi as a sitting judge of the Supreme Court and there was this young short man sitting next to me and he suddenly whipped out his card and gave it to me and it read it was an Indian gentleman saying, Vice President of Boeing Corporation, Seattle. So I said, what are you doing here? He said, sir, I've come here to sell Boeing planes to your government and the minister in charge wants X percentage on each Boeing and I am unable to give him that so the situation is going back and forth. And he kept on telling me all kinds of stories and when the plane was about to land, he said, by the way, what are you? Are you a businessman? I said, no, unfortunately, I'm a judge of the Supreme Court. So he said, I'm taking back everything I told you. <laughs> I said, why are you worried? Unless you put it on an affidavit and give it to me, I can't take any action. So don't worry, I've heard you from this year, it's going out of this year. This is the open way in which people ask for money and that is what is driving the economy underground. Now please see, a, a building like this is to be constructed. Now the cost of that will be X. Now, it will require some 200 permissions from 200 persons. The civil engineering department, structural department of the municipality, then the revenue department, then the fire, fire, fire department, this department, that department, and nothing less than the uh, aviation department because they say it is very high, our planes can't fly over that. Now, for everyone, fair enough. You have an official price. You have to pay so many thousands of rupees, make an application. It will be done legally. But at every stage, Every officer wants a bribe on this. Ah, music academy, well it must be a couple of crores, let me get something out of it. Now this is what is, and the builder who builds it says, Sir, how can I charge you only this amount, because I have to pay all these hungry mouths which are uh, yeah, yeah, yawning at me. Now unless I am able to give them, I won't get my permission, and that is why I need to take black money. And therefore, he says I have to take black money. If he has to take black money, now I can't pay him black money, therefore I have to generate black money. And one builder one told me, it is simple sir, every month you will draw some money from your account, keep it in cash, give it to me, as if it was such a magical formula. Not that I could afford to get money and give it to him. Yeah, solution. Solution, you want the solution? Be honest. That is where it is necessary. That is the solution, not your laws, not your judges, not your policemen. Are you honest? Do you pay your income tax? Have you ever cheated the income tax? My answer is never, never, never. If your answer never, then you are an honest man. That is the solution, not all this. This is all, this is all saying that I have got fever, sir. So what will I do? I will just take to put Amritanjal on your head. But what is the diagnosis? The diagnosis is the society is bereft with, uh, with this kind of a serious problem. Attack the problem, try to assuage the problem and not simply find this kind of cosmetic solutions. The solution ultimately is what, again I go back to Bhartrari and I shall stop with what my father told me when I was very young. My father told me that there was a sort of a mythical dialogue between a poor citizen, a probably a schoolmaster or a judge and Lady Lakshmi, Lakshmi is the giver of wealth, he says, Padme Murkha Janeshu Dada Sidravinam Vidvatsu Kimmat Saraha. She says, Oh Lady Lakshmi, why are you in the habit of giving money to fools? 
and why are you jealous of learned people? So Padmi, Padma looks at him, smiles and says, Naham matsari na chapi chapala naivasti murkhe ratihi. Murkhe bhyo dravidam dadami nitaram tatkaranam truyatam. I am not jealous of learned people. I admit that I give money to fools, but listen, there is a good reason for it. Vidwan Sarvajaneshu Pujita Tanuhu Murkhasya Nanyagati. A learned man, wherever he goes, is respected for his learning, but a Murkha has nothing else, therefore I give him money. To remember this, and then you will not chase money. That is my solution. Accept it if you like it. Don't accept it if you don't like it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Justice Shri Krishna. Uh, I now request Shri Puras Kaka to give his talk. Professor Arun Kumar, Justice Shri Krishna, Mr. Guru Murthy, my dear colleagues, uh, Venkat Raman and Gopal, honorable judges in the audience, friends, and above all, dear students. Dr. Subramanian started by saying that every time a logical connect is held, the law gets settled soon after that. Dr. Subramanian, please ask your astrology professor, but I predict that we may be here 10 decades from now and still not have a solution to black money. Jawaharlal now Nehru said on the night of our independence about India's tryst with destiny. I am going to give you a brief history and a tour of India's tryst with black money. At the end of this address, I hope you will be in a position to judge whether this battle is a success or a failure. And I think I saw a question from the audience saying that, what is the solution? I think the past may give us a solution if you hear me well. In my view, this tryst has so far been a failure. Let us rewind to 1947, when our country, full of optimism led by ethical and inspirational leaders, gained independence to where we are today. Today, we are still desperately to trying to find those same ethical leaders. I certainly believe that one of the greatest reasons for the change of government in Delhi and when I say Delhi, I mean at the national level and at the state level, the words black money and corruption have played a role like never before. Even internationally, tax avoidance has reached the highest levels of government. At every G8 today, at every G20 today, tax avoidance is at the highest level. Last year at the G8 in St. Petersburg, only two subjects were discussed. Syria and tax avoidance. Let us go back now to see how we have tried to deal with, as far as a matter of law goes, trying to deter black money from 1947 till today. Some of you mentioned pre-independence. Well, let me start out. We started out immediately post-independence in 1961 with our new act. And between 47 to 61, we had to introduce sections like 68 and 69 dealing with unexplained investments and unexplained cash. There were no corresponding provisions in the 1922 Act. So by 1961 already, India could feel the problem. That was not enough. Four years later, actually three years later, 69A, 69B, 69C, and 69D, dealing with unexplained in money, investments, expenses, and hundis came in. In all these provisions, attempts are made to catch taxpayers who are not ex able to explain their sources, etc., or not explain their income, etc. India must be one of the few countries in the world where officers check withdrawals from your bank accounts. Not because to find out whether you're living within your means, but to find out whether you're living, living in excess of your means. So, if your bank account shows that you're living like Mahatma Gandhi, but your photographs on Facebook or page 3 show that you're living 
extravagantly, the difference will be added as your income. For those who like statistics, just in the income tax reports of ITR, on section 68 to 69, we have 1,000 reported cases and hundreds of amendments. Errol Flynn once said, as one of the questions was, why is there need for this great black money? And the answer is, my problem lies in reconciling my gross habits with my net income. So these provisions were insufficient in 64. So we came to 72 when we identified immoral property as the great area where black money kept being invested. And we introduced chapter 20A allowing the governments to acquire black money when they felt the property was undervalued. 20A was a benign provision. It was a mild provision. It failed. So in 86, we introduced a draconian 20C which allowed the government to acquire property without giving you a hearing, without anything, just on the... Fortunately, the Supreme Court stepped in and says, no, you can't do this so arbitrarily. Justice Sri Krishna will probably remember the amount of cases he had to deal with as a judge dealing with arbitrary acquisitions of 20C. Now, let me give you a lesson why that provision failed and why it is important that we keep it in mind when we deal with the new Black Money Act. The critical thing is implementation. In 20C, we had some ridiculous orders being passed. Let me give you an example. There was a provision which allowed the government, when it acquired the property, to say that the property would vest in the government free of encumbrances. So many officers took the view that when an owner transferred his property, with sitting legal tenants, since the law said free of encumbrance, tenants, goodbye. Tenants were not even parties to the transaction. Now, when you come to this kind of an interpretation, you will see that the courts will step in. They will stop the harshness of the law. The law will ultimately fail. So, this was not the way to implement Chapter 20C. So, Chapter 20C died on July 1st, 2002. In between, we've made various other attempts to stifle the cash economy. In 1981, Chapter 20B was introduced. 269SS, 269T, 269TT, I'll run out of alphabet soon. Prohibiting loans more than 20,000, prohibiting checks more than 20,000. We then forward wind to the 80s to the 90s, where we find that despite all our provisions, people were not even filing returns of income. So what did we do? We made it compulsory then that even if you are an owner of immoral property or a tenant exclu exclu exceeding a specified area, you own a car, you own a telephone, you travel to a foreign country or even hold a credit card, you are liable to file a return. You can see how bad the problem is when owning a landline made you a person who the taxman had his eyes upon. All of us now own mobile phones. Can you imagine if this provision still existed? It died in 2005. George Bernard Shaw said, there are few more important things in life than a little money. One of them is a lot of money. Nothing stopped the juggernaut of the Indian cash economy. In the 80s, we had the images of a certain telecom minister wherein it was alleged that he had very poor sleep because his mattresses contained more paper than Dunlop foam. No party was, no party, and I'm very clear about that, no party was immune from the taint of corruption. And I believe that is one of our greatest problems. When you see those in power, those that ordinary people have to look up to, those you have to take orders from, living a life of corruption and getting away with it. How can you tell those who are trying to make ends meet to live with principles? A leading person said, in matters of principles, it is easy to have them when you are rich. The important thing is to have them when you are poor. But that is not human nature. 
It is difficult to tell a man struggling to make ends meet to have principles when all those around him do not. Somerset Mom said, money is the sixth sense which enables you to enjoy the other five. India, or at least a few in India, have been running after this sixth sense like never before and most importantly outside the four corners of tax law. So 20C died, 50C came in, which said that if you sell an immoral property today, you have to peg it for capital gains at the stamp duty value. Justice Sri Krishna, as you said, this only multiplies the departments that you have to deal with, the tax officer and the stamp duty department. So with this checkered history, we continue our tinkering with black money. We introduce section 56, etc., etc. Do you know that today, if you give a person any amount who is not related to you more than 50,000, even if he is ill or in great need of health, technically, he has to pay tax on more than 50,000. So you can't help anyone. We have really stringent laws, but they have completely failed. Now you can see the anger of the people. It was rising. And there was reports circulating of Indians having the largest amounts of money in Swiss bank accounts. In 2012, the director of the CBI said, Indians have 500 billion. He was immediately contradicted by the government, who said, no, 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 that figure is wrong. So the political class seemed to definitely hold out against this. Finally, in May 2012, as the pressure is growing, there is now a white on black. Let me explain. For the first time, a white paper is issued on black money. I tried to find out this origin of the term white paper. It comes from some things, all things like good and bad from the UK, from our colonial masters. Anyway, some of the estimates. Professor Arun Kumar, you'll be surprised to see the estimates in that white paper. They are nothing of what you mentioned. The Wanchu Committee says it's between 7 to 1,000 crores in 61 to 65. Dr. Rangneka says it's about double that amount. The NIPFP, which is mentioned, talks about 9,000 to 11,000 from 75 to 76, 20,000 to 23,000 from 80 to 81, and 31,000 to 36 from 83, 84. These figures are vastly different. Statistics are vastly different. And when you say now it's something like 75 lakh crore, you can see that there is no person who has really done any study. But one thing is consistent. It is only growing. Statistics may vary, but the problem is becoming larger and larger. Next part of the white paper, our favorite topic, the Swiss banks. This part is hopelessly incomplete. First of all, it starts by debunking a chain email, which apparently started circulating in 2009, that Indians have the largest assets in Swiss bank, hold your breath, 1,456 billion. The second closest country was Russia, one third of this amount, only 470 billion. So the white paper issued by the government says, this banking association which issued this email does not even exist. So the next report is some global financial integrity, which is, hold your breath again, 1.5 trillion. Again, this report is debunked in the white paper saying, no, no, their statistics are not correct. The only useful estimate referred into by the white paper the government says is a report by the Swiss National Bank which says the deposits by Indians have decreased from 23,000 crores in 2006 to 9,000 crores in 2010. And therefore, the report starts merrily patting itself on its back saying that the statement that Indians hold the largest amount in Swiss banks is not correct. What I find amazing about this report is, even if it is true that 23,000 crores has come down to 9,000 crores, what has happened to that 12,000? It's not somehow become declared money. It's probably shifted jurisdictions or come somewhere else. Second part, what I find amazing is, all right, but still, what are you going to do for that 9,000? I'm afraid I don't find any answers in that. A few interesting things in that white paper. 
In paragraph 2, if you will see, the white paper lists out two main ways and 23 sub ways of generating black money. So if you have the spare time and more importantly spare money, you know where to go. Don't tell them you to I told you this. One of the best conclusions about the white paper is what is the causes of black money? And it really starts out correctly how in the 1970s we went from the rates of 25 to 30 percent of the 1960s as far as tax goes to 85 percent plus 15 percent surcharge. Thus, in 1970, you had a tax rate effective of 97.75%. This was absurd. Humans are humans. If you expect a person to earn 100 rupees and give 97.75 to the government, forget it. It's not going to happen. You are going to make dishonest people out of honest people. And that is what happened to our nation. Another part which really went wrong in this white paper, it talks about corporate structures and how corporate structures are misused. And what surprisingly was mentioned was the Vodafone judgment. Now, all of, all of you know what the Vodafone issue was. It was about tax planning. Whether right, wrong, let's not make a judgment. But it has nothing to do with black money. Court may agree with it, not agree with it, but it has nothing. So it shows how disconnected perhaps this white paper was. But despite this white paper, I think there was a view that the government was not serious. The political will was missing, and here is where I agree with uh, Professor Arun Kumar and Justice Shri Krishna. Then comes a game changer. Ram Jitmalani files a petition in the Supreme Court of India which creates an SIT headed by two Supreme Court judges whose reputation is uncheckable. Un un For the first time, action now seems to be taken against everybody irrespective of high, high or low. Now, this is without control of the executive. Then, of course, we have that promise of, I don't want to quote who made it because I don't know, but apparently about something about 15 lakhs into each bank account. But I will come to that part a little later. Along with these provisions, India had these carrot policies. Every five years, 51, 65, 75, 81, 85, 1996, we had voluntary disclosure schemes. Some were a success, some were a not. Finally, thankfully, the government in 1996 filed an affidavit in the Supreme Court that we will do no more. These schemes do not encourage tax avoiders, I mean uh, taxpayers. They only encourage tax avoiders because they are waiting for the next one to come. Some of the absurdities of the 1998 scheme, a lady declared jewelry of two crores on the condition that her husband should not get to know about it. A housewife born in 64 declared her jewelry purchased in 61. People came from Zurich, Moscow, London to make declarations, even in their children's name. As I speak, the CBI is raiding Bank of Baroda in another black money scam, allegedly of 6,000 crores. So finally, with all this, we come to 2013. And the promise, as I pointed out, of some amounts in our bank account. The black money, undisclosed foreign income assets and imposition of tax 215 to spur people to declare black money. This act is the most draconian, it's the most stringent. It applies to all persons resident in India. It applies both to foreign income and assets, including financial interests. It taxes at a flat rate of 30% plus penalty of 90%. So if you have 100 rupees now because the disclosure window has closed, not only will you go to jail, but you'll have to find 20 rupees somewhere to pay for that 100 rupees. So it is now confiscatory. So, and it is deals with penalty and uh, imprisonment fr from 3 to 7 years. The compliance window of till 30th September has now closed. And I'm told that totally 4,147 crores was brought into India. If that is correct, I know all of you all are waiting for this. How much money is going to go into your account? It is going to be rupees, and this my junior has calculated, so I don't uh, 
कंफर्म रुपीज थर्टी फोर एंड फिफ्टी फाइव पैसे सो इफ दिस वॉलेंट्री विंडो इज ऑल्सो अ फेलियर आई गेट अ लिटल स्केर दैट दिस स्ट्रिंजेंट एक्ट ऑल्सो डज नॉट सीम टू डिटर पीपल हु हैव फॉरन इनकम और फॉरन एसेट्स एंड दिस एक्ट इज क्वाइट स्ट्रिक्ट नाउ वॉट डू वी डू वन ऑफ द लकी थिंग्स द गवर्नमेंट हैज गोइंग फॉर इट टूडे is the international movement against tax avoidance the financial crisis of 2008 has led all the governments to work together professor arun kumar mentioned two governments let me tell you how did india get the names of those 1400 people in the hsbc list which you saw on the indian express about 6 months ago it was got from germany and france how did germany and france get it i am told that they bribed a government a bank official sitting in hsbc in switzerland so you can see if the governments are going to be doing this there are no more rules in this game it's a good thing even as a tax lawyer i believe there is a distinction between tax planning and tax avoidance and i believe it is our duty whatever we are as tax lawyers to speak out against tax avoidance so there are no rules in this game and those names will be disclosed today there is a multilateral convention 58 countries including india are a signatory including countries which are su- supposed to be tax havens providing for automatic exchange of information from december onwards this information flow is going to be huge the governments will have to manage it but hopefully the age of secrecy is over so on this i will end with a few worrying thoughts and a few important thoughts i believe that this bill again if you implement it badly like 20c can be a problem so two advice don't go after the small fish students temporary employees because the harshness of your actions will make the court step in to reduce the rigor of the provisions go after the big fish and in a timely manner and set examples to deter others from going forward however at the end of the day black money act also treats the symptom the major causes is our electoral system the exemptions we give to agricultural income which make it easy to convert white into black There was a very famous Japanese proverb that says only lawyers and painters can convert white into black and black into white. All I can say is that the person who made this statement was not living in post independent India as he would find many more categories of persons capable of this ingenuity. Thank you. Thank you Ms Kaka I now request uh, Mr Venkatraman to give his talk <coughs> Very eminent and distinguished panelists learned judges senior councils law students general public and my well wishers thank you dr vaidya and times of india for making me sit along with this panel like any other listener here i have been listening to gurumurthy sir for the past 3 decades writing and re- reading his articles and today's it's a moment is time that i am impaneled as a panelist with him i take it as the greatest privilege you have given to me dr vaidya to be with him and i'll think i'll justify my presence here dr vaidya put a question <clears throat> all of you here are all under the impression tons and tons of black money or stashed in some foreign accounts in foreign lockers they are all rusting and if you put some effort these monies will come back to india and it will promote the economy gentlemen and ladies 
I may have to really disappoint you with a perspective to suggest all these monies have already come into India, either for constructive purposes or for destructive purposes. Monies don't rust in heavens, as we presume. Let's understand what is black money in the global sense. It has three components. The generation, the infiltration, and the use. Generation may be one country, infiltration may be many countries, and use could be from good to very bad. Now, what are the generating points? Black money gets generated in three ways. The crime component, the corruption component, and the tax evasion component. The first two component goes to destructive use and the last component goes to a constructive use. You are talking of numbers, IMF suggested in 2009 that it could be 18 trillion and the accretion is close to anywhere between 1.5 trillion to 3 trillion, many, many people say so. What do you mean by trillion, some numbers we need to understand as common man. One trillion is thousand billion. And one billion is six thousand crores. So if it is twenty trillion, it is twenty thousand crores into six thousand crores. That's the kind of money which we are talking about as black money in the global space. You can't carry it on your head, nor can you carry it like a Tamil villain in a box suitcase with a gun. It's such a huge money. So how do you, you need an architecture to actually infiltrate it, move it, transport it, and use it. Therefore, thus are born these so-called tax havens across continents. Each continent has its own tax haven. What do you mean by a tax haven? Broadly, tax havens are three in nature. Tax havens which simply support as a conduit where money hits the haven first so that money becomes a cheaper commodity thereafter. They don't do anything else, Cayman Islands, BV Islands, all these small islands. There is no big economic activity there. The second category of tax havens are fund managers. They do like what banks do. They collect money from various people and they are ready to fund people who have entrepreneurial skills are ready to fund. It's like money is fungible. You can't find out whether the money goes for terror is used or you can't go and find search a particular uh, trace of money. It, 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 it co-mingles and it goes for different uses. They are fund managers. And you also have tax havens which are entrepreneurial in nature. They have developed the trust of the world. You can invest it on them. They will play the game for you and they will also promote their own economies. These are the three types of tax havens which exist to, to launder, to move, to transport these trillions from one destination to the other. In 2009, Liechtenstein Bank Germany leaked some data. And in 2011, French government purchased, the man was ready to sell it for anybody, French government purchased it and displayed it to the world. Now, this prompted many people, many countries to understand what is this philosophy. If we need to understand black money in India, we need to understand black money in US. So that you understand the sharp contrast that happens. In US, they had only two problems. When the 9-11 attack happened, they found out on investigation that crime money is infiltrating into US. And from 2001 to 2008, they shot it down. More than 90 countries passed money laundering laws. When the subprime crisis came in 2008 or 2009, where there was an economic slowdown and economy started sinking in few places, they understood 
that this is happening because of the tax evasion component. Now, what do you mean by a tax evasion component in a global sense? You need, India needs, let's take a simple illustration, India needs a software. And there is somebody who can do it in US. All that he can do is sell the software from US to India for $100. Now you pay him $100 into the US account, then it suffers a tax of 30 to 35%. $35 will go into tax. So what does the US entity do? It creates an entity in Ireland where the tax rate is 12.5%. Gives the right of exploitation to Ireland. Ireland creates as another entity in Singapore where you have a treaty benefit just you have to do a few just you have to do a few uh, operational exercises to sustain yourself as a as a growing concern in that state and that state sells the software to India at $100 so you pay $100 to Singapore Singapore retains $15 it transfers $85 to Ireland and Ireland transfers $10 to USA for using the patent. So instead of $35, US gets $3.5 as tax. And $85, $75 suffers 12.5%. Now, a more ingenious enterprise does it this way. Between US and Ireland, it creates one more entity in Cayman Island, which is a zero tax jurisdiction and pushes $65 into Cayman Island. Now you have $10 in US, suffers $3 tax, $15 in Ireland, which suffers $1.5 as tax. This is the final study. They found out Google's, Facebook's, Apple's, etc., etc., paid just 4% of their global income as tax because of the structure. And therefore, now they have moved from an exchange of information era into an automatic exchange, which will actually be vibrant from 2017. 72 countries have signed, saying that on a click of a button, you should be able to provide a bank statement, which is not happening today. These leaked data right now in various tax jurisdictions where we are all fighting cases, or when government says that it is not that easy, it is not that easy. One thing you must remember, government is extremely active in getting the information. And the tax department is pursuing the matter very, very vigorously. Don't think that they are lying low. They are working on it. But like an extra decision process, every tax jurisdiction has a disclosure proceedings happening in that territory. You are entitled to fight your case, whether this data relates to you or not. And there is an appellate process. Once you succeed, then the government can disclose. And in, a, in, in all, all over the world, in spite of the greatest pressure by US and the rest of the countries, small countries have organized themselves so carefully that the judiciary, tax administration, and the government, they work in one sink. Not a single paper will move out of without, knowing, without one knowing the other. So this is where exactly litigation on disclosure is presently. This is the US scenario in India. It's extremely the opposite. US never had transactional corruption as an issue on black money. It had a crime component, which it shot it down considerably in eight years. It has a tax evasion component, which it's now working out through an automatic exchange route. That's not the scenario in India. In India, we generate black money. That's the problem. You can't simply say it's a global issue and therefore India is part of the... No, Indian, Indian scenario is extremely unique. As Porus was saying, the BRICS, the Brazil, Russia, India and China, we contribute the maximum to global black money. Perfectly BRICS. We contribute the maximum. All four, all four put together. We are all generating centers. And how do we generate it? We generate it essentially in two buckets. One bucket is completely non-productive buckets. Take the case of stock market. You must know stock market is the biggest laundering and whitewashing machine today in the country. 
all that you need you can hunt there is, there is lobbies to hunt for it a 10 rupee stock will keep going up to 1000 rupees and gullible investors will keep chasing that stock you must understand whitewashing is happening and the fellow who whitewashes knows when to exit you do not know so once the activity is over he will exit and the 1000 rupee stock will come down to 10 paise hitting you all so stock market real estate liquor government's surest source of revenue for any state government is liquor business because liquor is under the state control you can, you can talk volumes about how monies are made out of liquor gold these are the areas sports can you promise not to watch a sporting event for one year it will reduce considerable generation of black money in india you can't we are all blaming uh, poor uh, indian who collects a couple of thousand to vote all of us contribute to this in one way or the other we must understand it now what is the common current what is the common feature we say stock we say gold we say liquor we say real estate what is the common factor the common factor is wherever there is a mass consumption base it allows you to do black money dealings generation conversion white into black black into white etc 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 so india is a powerful black money generating economy now there is one more bucket it's a constructive bucket which is what the businessman does under invoicing over there will be tax concession on exports etc etc starting from for us did a huge history from 47 at least from 78 80 90 88 you have several 80 hcs 80 exemptions all these are export benefits you under invoice over invoice and get the money now how does the money that's the point you must understand this money come back to the state of origin not only generate and you it's you're not doing charity show you generate it for a purpose these monies come back to india to the respective destinations including india how do they come they come in two forms the forms which do not go for constructive corporate wealth growing prospects money comes invariably through foundations trusts charitable institutions etc 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 they are simply a conduit for an end use which is not constructive there is another end use which is all we are talking about or we want to we want to basically stage them as hostages this is the constructive way of allowing investments to happen in an economy the same money comes back in the form of three forms of investments over a period of 20 years one is the fdi route foreign direct investment which all of us know shares the second is the gdr the global depository receipt scheme and of the recent origin third is the participatory notes and remember gentlemen remember gentlemen i have no conviction about this economic growth i have absolutely i ridicule it at a personal level because it has killed our value systems it has killed our family peace it has killed several things but but don't clap our rulers have embraced this philosophy saying that this ultimately gives happiness to each one of us so you have embraced the philosophy for 25 years what did you do government has partnered this investment they allow you to bring this fdi with a red carpet how you have a mauritius each one has a heaven india also has a heaven we have mauritius and remember you can't buy a stroke of a pen take, take the dta from mauritius it's not possible it is not financial compulsions it is political compulsions beyond 6000 kilometers of sea the first neighbor we have today a reliable neighbor is mauritius how can you now negate your dta each country has their own dynamics to handle now this money comes in the form of an fdi more importantly the recent instrument is the p note participatory note it assures you assures you concealment of the investor's identity assures you you are not supposed to identify the investor this is these are all government created instruments nothing illegal about it please understand nothing illegal about it so how does it flow 
We are all talking of so much of tax avoidance, all these are culprits. Please understand what these culprits are doing. These culprits say, assuming they bring 10,000 crores from Mauritius into India, under the DTA, this 10,000 crores which hits into India cannot be taxed. Because it is not an income, it is a capital in nature. Capital is not taxed. So it is a tax-free money that comes into India. You employ it. You pay salaries. You grow. And say it, the share from 10,000 crores improves to 15,000 crores. If you sell the Indian share of, say, 5,000 crores, you need to pay 20% capital gains tax. 1,000 crores, you need to remit it to the Indian Income Tax Department. But if you sell the holding structure share in Mauritius, your DTA, your executive has signed the agreement, says that 5,000 crores share sold in Mauritius is not taxable. It's free from capital gains tax. So you sell that 5,000 crores, earn that extra 1,000 crores which otherwise have to remit it in India. No illegality. The same thousand crores is recycled back. It is capital in nature. No illegality. Your investment completely transparent, not like liquor or gold. It's all shown in the books. Your multiplication shown in the books. Your sale is captured in the books. Your revisit is shown in the books. That is the illegality. The possible illegality could be the source of that first 10,000 crores possible. That's exactly what this data is at all. Debate is going on. Whether that money is of an Indian origin or of an entrepreneurial origin, an Indian entrepreneur can go and purchase money from these heavens. It's possible. It's not that every time you have to transport money. If you have entrepreneurial skills, banks are ready to fund you. So if you bring your money that way, the first portion of a so-called illegality of uh, uh, import into India may survive, may not survive. This is how the structure works and it generates wealth. You also have structures, let me be very clear, you also have structures which are simply used as conduits for round tripping, bribery, corruption and for sheer valuation without any substance or economic activity. I don't say all structures in India are legal or valid. And that's why Supreme Court in Vodafone judgment said structures which add wealth, please see the duration of the structure. Please see the quantum of investment. Please see the employment they generate. Please see the salaries they pay. Please see the taxes that they have remitted out of this uh, transaction in India and see how sustainable they are going to be in future. If there is an economic activity, then leave them. Don't touch it. Don't see the Rishi Mulam, Nadi Mulam of it. As simple as that. But the same judgment says, if it is without substance, meant for round tripping, bribery or corruption, hunt their heads. Now, when this is so, you have now brought a legislation called the Black Money Act. Porus said, I join issue with him. There can't be a more draconic legislation in this country post-independence. Most draconic. Simply clueless. Anybody can now be arrested. Anybody can be tried. For You read this act with laundering act. It can be the best tool for anybody to hunt anybody's head. I'll tell you how. See, now after understanding how the structure works, you have per four permutations happening in India, people who keep generating black money. And there is an outbound, money goes out. That's our belief. Or goes into the stock market or whitewashing machines like that. There is no big strong will to shoot them there. That's one kind of category. Two is your positive structures. Three is your negative structures where they use it as a round tripping. And fourth is your trust funds, foundation, etc., etc., etc. I'm just asking you a question. If you are a CBA officer or a tax officer, if you are asked to prioritize, whom will you shoot first? Will you shoot the man who creates wealth in India or the man who plunders and takes money out of India? That's a simple point. The history shows governments do not have the will to shoot 
plunder is. That's the point. That's the flash point. One thing, one thing, one thing. We should, we should, we should, a commendable job has been done by media. Commendable job has done been writers like Guru Murthy Sar in bringing to light certain issues. Without a doubt. Without a doubt. I have, I am simply not going into that. But that cannot validate a presumption that India is a corrupt free country. India still is a corrupt economy. That's the problem. So, today you have four sets of people. Whom are you going to shoot down? Your own, your own history. Two judgments says. Judgment in the case of Ramjit Malani. Two judges say the mine mafia political operator nexus. These are all not my expressions, sir. Expressions used in the judgment. How do they behave? First philosophy is greed is a good culture. Expression used in the judgment. Greed is a good culture. Two, you can trade, buy, sell anything for a price. Three, it says the unholy nexus between the lawmaker, the law keeper, and the law breaker makes India a soft state. What more credentials do you need here to brand people? This is all flowing out of a judgment. Now, the second judgment is the Bombay High Court bail order in the case of Hassan Ali Khan. What did he do? He did not do anything very serious or big. All that they could seize in 2007 from him was just, just some sensitive documents worth simply a small sum, 68,000 crores. Not big, 11.5 billion. The penalty which HSBC Bank paid to the US government. That's all they seized. 2007 to March 2011, no action. 2011 March, public pressure arrested. 2011 August, released on bail. And today we are on October 2015, no action. So all you need is to just cool your heels for four months. And that's good sufferance of punishment after seizing sensitive documents worth 70,000 crores. So where is the will? So you now have a legislation to act. See, so far you did not have a legislation. You had only policy. You had only policy. So we can speak, I can speak, we can write, we can debate. Now you have a law. You have armed the tax administration to implement this law. Last one minute. I know. 535 I should. I will. So, let me, let, me, let me close down saying the amnesty scheme was a complete failure for several reasons. And thank God, thank God, it didn't come to light because the befitting panelists across channels were discoursing more on befitting and therefore this paled into insignificance. Now, we are not a matured economy to handle this back money because we are very selective in our approach. Please, if you are going to target these corporate entities and make them the guinea pigs because they are the easy victims to shoot, then it will send a wrong signal to the global investors that it becomes an anti-investment legislation. How do you stop it? Cattle and cows helped us from amnesty, amnesty scheme. Let's invent more stronger animals, leopards, lions, elephants, giraffes, so that they occupy national time. And this goes out of public memory. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Venkatraman. Now I request uh, Mr. Gopal Subramaniam to please give his presentation. Professor Arun Kumar, Justice Sri Krishna, Mr. Guru Murthy, my colleagues Mr. Venkatraman and Porus Kaka, uh, distinguished judges and members of the bar, and ladies and gentlemen. 
I'm going to actually give possibly a different dimension to the subject of black money. And I'm looking at it, first of all, from a purely constitutional sense. We're not dealing with currency or with some paper. We are not dealing with simply money in empirical terms. We are dealing with, I think, a tremendous cost which a country pays to its own constitution and social psyche. And I think the damage is so irretrievable that it cannot be evaluated ever in terms of pounds, sterling, dollars, anything. Because what you do by means of black money is that you violate, shall we say, every possible tenet which the constitution obliges either the executive or the legislature or the citizens or those who are in authority to observe. And the result is that you actually pay an enormous price in terms of what we call as the exercise of free will. Are we really autonomous in that sense when we actually vote in this country? If you have wads of currency notes which have a slip of paper and people are tempted to vote in a general election, if you have advertisements which are full page advertisements a little shorter than the photographs of many of the deities which you keep in your shrines, are you actually leading to a situation where people are going to trust and freely vote on the basis of informed choice? And I'm afraid the first direct hit which I think black money has is upon the right to vote, is upon the right to vote freely, is upon the right to choose candidates who deserve to be chosen, who at least deserve to be in the political fray. I have always been wonderstruck that how is it that the recommendations which were given by the then Chief Election Commissioner, and I'm very happy to see him in this audience, Mr. Gopala Swami, about the need to remove people with taint from public life by having stringent provisions in the Representation of People's Act actually was never passed. Why is it that the suggestions of the Commission that there must be auditing of political parties has never been accepted? I wonder why is it that political parties are shy that they should actually have allocated spending and they should be seen what they are worth without the help of advertisers and shall we say allies and slogan catchers and television serials and wonderful anchors and also some cosmetic agents and shall we say even dress provocators. I mean, is that really what democracy is about? And where does all this money come from? Does this money actually come from a tree in the head office of a political party that you just shake it and that money falls when election is about to take place? Where do these crores of rupees come from? How is it that in the Delhi University in a students' union election, we're now talking about a university students' union election. You find that there is a group of people who are aligned to the Congress. They're students. Well, I'm very impressed that they read so much of history and they believe in so much of ideology. There's another group of people who belong to a certain another political outfit and it could be called Akil Bharatiya Vidyartiya Parishad. 
Maybe there's a third one, Students' Federation of India. But would you not like to know what is the money they spend on their own self-glorification by way of posters in the Delhi University when the elections have to take place? And it is more than five crores. And I want to know, who gives them five crores? They're students studying in BSc pass course. One is BA pass course. A third one is a BCom who failed once but actually has got in through a compartment and is now standing for elections. And there's a fourth one who actually has been in the university for the last nine years who has pursued different master's programs and now wants to study MA philosophy. And now who are these political parties who actually give this five or six cross? And why do they give it to them? Is it because they are enormously inclined to the potential of the youth? And they feel that these are the flowering blossoms of future India? It is that they feel that these are people, a constituency which must be cultivated so that as and when you have your political regular elections, these men will also join the bandwagon. Now, just let us look at what exactly is the quantum of money which is spent in an election which is not accounted for. Now, the election commission has given a ceiling. And uh, I know that uh, Mr. Gopalaswamy said, well, make it as realistic as possible, but there ought to be a ceiling. But there is a ceiling. But do people really observe that ceiling? How is it that you have candidates who stand for election? Forget the political party. Actually, there is something so wonderfully common and unique about our political system that they all have similar DNA. There is very little to distinguish them. But I wonder, when I looked at the affidavits of disclosure of assets of a candidate, now the candidate has been in political public life. On day A, that is, in the 2009 elections, he had assets, which was 240 crores. Well, it's quite possible. Uh, could be due to hard work, very eminent strife and labor. But when it came to 2014, he had 486 crores. Now, I would like to know, could you all help me? Could you help me to double this? From where did this money come from? And nobody questions it. And the election commission which wants to question it is not empowered by parliament to question it. There is a vested interest in not permitting the election commission which is the custodian of political democracy in our country and we must not forget that it was Er Swaminathan in 77 who ensured free and fair elections and there could be no rigging which could be attempted in this country and a government which was completely tyrannical could be simply overthrown now why is it that institution must not be vested with powers to ensure that there is actually audit and accounting of monies which come into the political system. So black money is actually the lifeblood of political survival. And if it is the blood which is running through the veins of our democracy, I'm afraid it is bound to produce polluted consequences at every stage. And I'm going to tell you a couple of illustrations. One, we spoke about this Prevention of Money Laundering Act. It almost looks like uh, 
a special mantra which is going to suddenly bring about huge, huge amounts of money back into this country. But I want you to look at the legislative history. The discussion started in 1998 because of a gentleman who is sitting here, Mr. Guru Murti. And do you know, they actually found that it was such a complicated law, it was so difficult that it needed four years to draft the bill. Four long years. And when you see that law, actually that law will have to be laundered again to make some sense. It is called the Prevention of Money Laundering Act. And why did we pass it? Because of what our previous speakers mentioned about G20. Uh, I like G because I have a name which begins with G, but I wouldn't like to be associated with either G8 or G20. Now, let me tell you something which you must know. I have read all these documents about black money. Any number of reports. You have the World Bank report, you have Transparency International, you have financial integrity, global financial integrity. And the tables are good looking, some of them are blue in color, some of them red graphs. And but I noticed one thing, that they all talk about only one table. The table is outflow of money from developing countries. I found it rather odd that uh, does money actually flow only out of developing countries? Then where do they actually go into? We don't know those countries. The money which goes out from the developing countries actually go into the countries which we assume are small little islets, you know. Uh, population is also not more than 2,000. There are a couple of post boxes and it's one is called the British Virgin Islands. Some of them are inhabitable, but maybe if you take a ship, you could possibly open a company there with a post box if you put one inside the sand. But who controls these British Virgin Islands? The United Kingdom? Who controls the other set of islands? The United States? So who are the people who are receiving these monies? It is actually these two countries. That is why you actually say that the largest amount of money which is in Switzerland is really owed to these two countries. And no wonder Germany as well as France, they said we want to just walk out of your G20. Just allow us to get out. Because this is just not transparent enough. Because you have some Cayman Island. Now tell me, would any one of you know whether you can incorporate a company in the British Virgin Islands? But India, you know, we are always Atidi Devo Bhava. So we're always looking for investments. So where do these investments come from? They start, as Mr. Venkatraman said, as Mr. Kaka said, from that little island. Who brought the money to that island? Who took the money to that island? Well, we don't know. If it is through a participatory note, you say, I don't know. If it is through a GDR, you actually find that there is a bank behind the bank, behind the bank, behind the bank. So you have six banks behind one GDR. And then there's something called, lovely, it's called hedge fund. Now I like the idea of a hedge which is in a garden. But I never knew that this hedge fund was a euphemism, complete euphemism, for 
bankers to say, we want your money to grow. Now why would somebody say the Royal Bank of Scotland be interested in my money wanting to grow? And how will he make it grow? Will he actually plough it in Scotland? I've been wondering. And then the answer was very clear. That there is a complete consortium of a global economy which is driven on totally immoral considerations without production, without manufacture, without any services, without actual growth. Can you believe that out of the total income which is generated in the world, how much of it do you really think is attributable to the production of real goods and services? And what did we do in our country? You know, we are people who are enormously innovative, we love this World Bank very much. Uh, we like its reports. We usually look to it for solace every now and then. And uh, I can tell you very quickly that the World Bank reports have been, they have marched us on to what is called this liberalization, which itself was abandoned by the author of liberalization in 1994. And what we did was we just copied liberalization allowed FDI to come in and the FDI which came in was of people who actually were our own cunning citizens, the greedy men whose greed can't stop. Now, let's be very clear. When you say greedy, please remember some people's greed doesn't stop. Now, that's one part. Second, we have the Loader Committee looking into the affairs of BCCI. Do you know what is the money involved in betting? 76,400 crores. Now, what is that money about? Number three, real estate. Everybody in this country knows. You know, sir, there's a white component, there's a black component, and the black component, and the white component. No, I, one doesn't understand. And he has Lord Venkatachalapathy's photograph right behind him. <laughs> now, the white and the black. And he says... I need 50, 50. If he's kind, 60, 40. Now what is this about? And all this is black money. And then, thirdly, there's another industry. You want to be posted? There's something called lucrative postings in the civil services. I thought they were servants of the public, but they're no longer uh, servants of the public. But they are meant to have lucrative postings. What is meant by lucrative postings? Where does this gentleman plough money from? Does he dig it from his backyard? How do you account for the fact that an IAS officer and his wife, both IAS officers in Madhya Pradesh, had hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of crores? And why? Because that has become a culture of the day. Fourthly, we are talking about gold. It's all right. But how does gold come in? Does it come in through the straight route? No. Then four, the policy makers. My God, Mr. Guru Bhakti, you have to hear this. And this is from my own experience. Policy makers, they are wonderful. You know, one of the greatest things about Indian democracy is that a policy document is never tabled in Parliament. It used to be done earlier. But, you know, because men are very busy, they're so busy, that they actually don't table it in Parliament. It gets leaked out through the media. Then somebody decides to take it up. So your import and export policies, uh, Mr. Gurumulti, you would remember, that they have addendum. You know, this slide, thin one, that is be below 61.416.122. Please read with an inverted commas. The meaning of the word shall be and shall be deemed to have always been to include. And what is the cost of that shall be deemed to have been included? I did a case. It was worth 15,400 crores. And the government of India actually 
wanted the appeal to be dismissed on the ground of delay. You know how sincere they are? You said about taxmen pursuing very vigorously. I'm telling you that governments adopt very wary tactics and they hope that the judges will simply stamp them and give them an imprimatur of approval. The point I'm making is, ladies and gentlemen, this is a topic which of course has implications on tax, it has implications on laws, but I think more than anything else, it has serious implications for constitutional morality, number one. And number two is, I think there has to be a change at all levels. It cannot be a change just at any one level and you hope that there is some sort of a miraculous metamorphosis of what is called black money. Black money, let me tell you, and I'm finishing now, is it deprives you of what is called fraternity and equality in the Constitution. The moment a person has money, over and above what he should, the arrogance of that money, the ability to manipulate with that money, actually gives him a completely unfair and arbitrary advantage in the existence in our society. We must consciously, collectively negate it. And I welcome you to negate it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gopal Subhanim. Now I request the last speaker, Mr. Guru Murthy, to make his presentation. <laughs> Professor Arun Kumar, who probably was the one who initiated me into the study of black money and you ultimately send me to jail. I will tell you later how. <laughs> Justice B. N. Krishna, my friend Gopal Subramanyam, uh, uh, Mr. Poras Kaka, and my friend Mr. Venkatraman. It's a very, very distinguished audience. It is impossible to gather an audience of this kind for a panel like this to address. The panel must be more fortunate because it is difficult to assemble an audience of this quality and competence. You know, black money has been a subject of my personal experience. I am not talking from theoretical, legal or moral point of view. In fact, I will keep morality aside. Though very much that is one of the drives of mine to understand and fight this subject in my life. You know, after I passed my chartered accountancy course, to understand how black money is generated, I joined a very small firm of chartered accountant in Saukarpet in Chennai. That is where you understand how black money is generated, how people work, what is the psychology. And one and a half years I studied this phenomenon. I understood the impact of tax law, impact of corruption, impact of the tax departments, laxities as to how black money is a self-perpetuating and uh, self-promoting phenomenon. I was uh, by accident I got into investigative journalism because there was no journalist willing to dry, write on a dry subject like reliance or uh, shares or imports the kind of thing which uh, Gopal Subramanian mentioned that a very small line, a word which gives a benefit of 15,000 crores. Nobody was willing to write because people thought, the journalists thought nobody would read them. When I began investigating all this, then my familiarity, my understanding, my experience of how black money gets generated and how it could be prevented, what is the means of fighting it. You see, these faculties also grew in me. With the result, you know, as I was dealing more and more with businessmen, with corporates, with black money generators, I also had to maintain a distance with it. So I gave up signing balance sheets in 1979 because I could never 
come to terms with signing a balance sheet with true conscience i gave up my tax practice in 1983 when the tax department was far better than it was today and i was almost left to fend for myself working only on consultancy why i am mentioning this is that black money is not an issue of pontification it's an issue of practice and for a chartered accountant to practice honesty and integrity and maintain a certain standard it's not an easy task and uh, by a combination of circumstances i was under the tutelage of the kanchi mahaswami when i went to him to get his blessing to start practice he asked me will you be like other chartered accountants i had no idea as a young man i had no idea how other chartered accountants were i asked him what will you bribe a government official i said no then will you generate black money i said no you know these two things i would never have practiced this but for the fact he initiated me into it why there is a moral underpinning to black money and fighting black money with this you know we always talk about corrupt politicians i have seen corruption among many enlightened professions look at the way the chartered accountant institute elections are held there is no difference between that and general elections look at the way the bar council elections are held is there any difference between that and general elections is there any difference between lions club elections today i have gone to some of the middle towns where in lions club to get elected people spend 4 crores 5 crores so you can't pick up only politicians in fact my understanding of politicians is that they are at least open to criticism judges are not journalists are not so i have a very different view political corruption is the easiest corruption we talk about that it is also a corruption which we can easily control but judicial corruption we must talk about corruption in every field we should not choose a particular field because there is nobody to defend himself here you know we talk about greed the entire economic model of the world today is based on what maynard keynes said in the year 1934 if you want the economy to survive and grow and progress you have to become greedy and you have to shut down all the religious values which put restraint on greed this is the basis on which the entire economic theory of today the market economics works we can't say we should not be greedy and work the same economics so there is a contradiction between the economic theories the development models about which mr venkatraman spoke and at the same time we should say we should not be greedy so it is a multi dimensional problem and uh, i would like to deal with it in a more in a helicopter view with a helicopter view you know in 1985 when i started to investigate black money when i went abroad i went to switzerland and i asked the swiss bankers through my association with many journalists what is the kind of indian money that is supposed to be lodged in swiss bank you know it is not money that is lodged it is managed by swiss bankers it may be in any part of the world it may be even in india but how is this money how much is the quantum of money i was stunned when they told me it was about 300 billion dollars in 1985 end that is what made me feel that something has to be done i advised the government of india at that time the finance minister was very close to me and the enforcement director borelal was one of the most honest bureaucrats i had come across and vc pande the revenue secretary such bureaucrats cannot be seen today like that so i advised them to engage a foreign detective agency called fairfax and i told them we have no money to pay but we will give you 25% of whatever is the amount detected out of your investigative efforts that was the agreement that was signed you know on the side we gave them some fairfax we told them you also pursue the gandhi family there is a lot of money in it in that family that got leaked out to rajiv gandhi and that is why rajiv gandhi arrested me it is not because that a foreign detective agency was engaged to which some secrets were being passed from here a letter that was forged 
to get me arrested actually to stop the investigation i understood that pursuit of brahmani means you have to take on the high and mighty and it is not only for a journalist it is true of a prime minister also you must understand that an honest prime minister has to take all the risks even to fight black money it is not easy for a prime minister who is honest to have only honest ministers only honest bureaucrats only honest income tax officers he inherits the same corrupt system so i have a feeling which i will come at the end before that i want to construct the whole uh, architecture global architecture i have a, a difference of opinion with mr professor arun kumar the amount of black money generated in india which has gone out of india maybe even have come back to india as good money laundered back is almost two thirds of the total black money generated in india and there are lot of studies to that effect and i will say the tax evaded money within india is a municipal tax affair but the tax tax evaded money which goes out of india is a treasonable money and that has to be tackled first black money was no issue at all in the world till 2008 when the whole global economy was going up and up and everybody was seeing only prosperity stock market growth and financial market growth was supposed to indicate the prosperity of the every nation and the country and so nobody talked about it it is only when the 2008 collapse occurred then the g20 nations woke up because of the efforts of as mr gopal subramanian mentioned france and germany they said that this anglo saxon financial model will destroy the world and unless you are going to act against the tax havens we will walk out of the meeting you know who were the people affected in this i will give you two significant facts which will indicate what is the challenge that we are facing you see the total high net worth individuals worth today is 55 trillion dollars 55 trillion dollars it was just 5 trillion dollars in 1997 in 14 years it has grown by 10 to 11 times but the gdp in this period has grown only by one and a half times the market capitalization has grown only by three times it is the high net worth individuals assets which has gone up this is one of the reasons people like piketty have written books that this is not a sustainable model this may collapse any time but the more important part is that 21 to 31 trillion dollars out of it is offshore this is kept out of accounting where is this money gone rightly mr gopal subramanian mentioned that it is the developed nations which have benefited out of the black money generated in developing nations there is actually a figure which has been worked out by a researcher and i will give you that figure us has a cash deposit of 2.2 trillion dollars and it assures secrecy for people who have kept the money and say we will not reveal your name to anyone they are asking for the names of everybody who belongs to america who has invested secretly outside america but who have invested in america america offers protection 2.2 trillion dollars and cayman islands 1.55 trillion dollars as you know cayman islands is a small island of 200 people or whatever and the researcher says 70% of that money has come back to the united states and uh, the uk has 1.53 trillions that means about 5 trillion dollar has gone only to these two two countries that is why they were resisting the assault on tax havens in the year 2010 when whole world was looking for it only two countries provided the lead and we kept quiet you know the indian government represented by the prime minister of india was the only country to keep quiet on this they neither sided with people who wanted an assault on the tax havens or people who did not want it it is only in 2014 november indian government took a firm stand that we want transparency and we want an assault on the 
four years nothing happened in this country and in this period we put out a, a, a white paper it is anything but white we put out a white paper saying that there is no black money at all and the whole thing is only uh, 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 messing up by journalists by uh, global financial integrity and some non existent uh, swiss banking association but the fact is between 1990 and 2008 the whole world economy had undergone such a change unless we understand the global architecture we will not be able to under- unravel the issue of black money you know the global financial assets today in 2010 it was 600 trillion dollars but the global gdp was 63 trillion dollars the global savings was only 15 trillion dollars 15 trillion dollars had multiplied into 600 trillion dollars in 2020 this figure will improve to 900 trillion dollars the gdp will be 90 trillion dollars and the savings will be 23 trillion dollars 23 trillion dollars have multiplied into 900 trillion dollars this is called funny money this entire money gets control over assets but as mr gopal subramaniam said there is absolutely no productivity involved in this this is the mighty force we are fighting and goldman sachs which had only 1.5 trillion dollar assets to control has 6.2 trillion dollars today in spite of the fall in the markets in spite of the depression in the world economy the monetary economy is growing so we have to understand that this is a global phenomenon and the black money estimates about india is the global financial integrity has estimated that we have something like 800 billion dollars have been stashed out of india how much has come back in the form of uh, uh, participatory notes and other means is a matter for investigation but the fact is this kind of money has gone out has been scientifically estimated and we cannot brush it aside money is there in india but how much of that money it has been stashed away from india there is a an estimation which is scientific and which cannot be brushed aside and global financial integrity says generally the product it is the product of corruption bribery kickbacks criminal activities desire to amass wealth without the knowledge of the government it is not just to avoid tax i don't want the fact that i want the money to be known to the system that means it is criminal money it is bribery so the money that is stashed out of india is not out of business transactions it has to do with trans business affairs involving the executive the bureaucracy the journalists and i would not even exclude the judiciary what is the difference between what happened in the last 10 years and what's happening now i will capture there is a need for a global architecture to tackle this it cannot be tackled by one country there are many countries which are interested in black money because the black money of other countries is needed for the development of that country every country is fighting to keep others black money with us and to recover their own black money from others this is the game in this game the people who have lost out are the people who have generated the black money and lost the black money so we need a global architecture g20 is the only mechanism through, through which we can create this architecture and i am particularly happy the government of india is forming alliances with germany switzerland singapore british virgin islands as india's partners it is very important it is happening for the first time no one has even looked at it this is the news of october and the in uh, uh, november 2014 the prime minister took up the black money issue in g20 meeting as a priority that is why g8 discussed this as the one of the two items because all the countries which are affected are putting pressure on the countries which have benefited even switzerland is now coming uh, out of its shell because they also feel that they have to work with the rest of the world there is a base erosion and profit shifting bips model which has virtually made uh, mauritius a tax haven for the first time 
the indian government has accepted that we will not allow profits to be shifted from india to mauritius and not to be taxed in mauritius this decision should have been taken long ago in fact when yashwant sinha was finance minister i told him just 7.5 billion dollar is the amount that has come into fii uh, stock market please stop this this is funny money this can run down the country now it is 180 billion dollars we cannot control it this kind of money we cannot fight so we have created this problem for ourselves with the stock market which has nothing to do with us because only 3% of the indian savings gets into the stock market rest is only the foreign money that is playing here and i am extremely happy that the government of india has taken this base erosion and profit shifting bips model and so far as the what the government should do i entirely agree with a point that was made here that you should act against the high and mighty and make one case an example case i don't know how much time i have i will just deal with the uh, hasan ali case which mr gopal subramanian represented and very honestly in spite of the fact that he was representing a government which was not so honest he told the he told the supreme court that you have to investigate hasan ali case from national security angle you know what are the facts of the case the facts of the case will shock you in the on the 7th of january 2007 hasan ali is raided and they find a letter from UBS AG whomsoever it may concern UBS limited hereby confirms as per the telephonic discussions between our client Khan and the chairman's office today agreed to the following the client can withdraw part of his assets to the tune of 6 billion today another 2 billion after 15 days this is the letter that was seized and you see what it says account number withheld identification withheld client details with her it is addressed to hasan ali khan so he is neither of this he is not the client he is not the account holder he is not the identified person hasan ali told after you know for four years he was away nobody could trace him he was in hospital but at the same time he was loitering around with all the congress chief ministers and the congress treasurer advisor to the prime the congress president at that time he was seen with all this affidavits were filed in the supreme court that this man is loitering around nobody bothered about it ultimately when he was caught he said i was asked to open the account i opened the account in 1962 and from that time onwards monies that are being deposited in i am supposed to get 0.1% and even the commission is not being paid to me so somebody is operating this account all these facts are there but the entire enforcement department income tax department cbi the court was exasperated so i advise this government only one thing unravel hasan ali's case see what happens to the issue of black money it is not hasan ali behind the screen there are people if their names come out then you see what happens to the system one important case being cracked is more important than passing 10 laws so you have got to go for the jugular of the powerful of the people whose evidence is in your hands i have myself seen the evidence we may not be able to say it openly or prove it today but i have seen one political leader's account being linked to 20 persons 15 of them political leaders five of them industrialists and that political leader can give directions to operate the account of all the people in whose name funds are deposited whose money it is i told this government you bring out this one fact that will be the way by which this is what america is doing this is what germany is doing this is what france is doing this is what philippines did there is a way of fighting black money once you make this clear that it can't work i think it is doable and i suppose there is a difference between the previous government and this government the previous government denied the existence of black money this government swears by the existence of black money so there will be public pressure there has to be public pressure put on this government to act and i am sure something will happen people like us are not going to keep quiet let us have hope that things will improve 
and we need not always have to be the nothing will happen maybe after 5 years if we hold a discussion on this topic we may have something good to report so thank you mr gurumurthy <coughs> now i think the floor is open for uh, questions mr gurumurthy talked about public pressure so i think the public has to be proactive Hmm? Uh, my name is raghavan i am the uh, company secretary with legal background uh, kindly throw some light on this betting and I, and there are uh, clubs or laws in uk which allows football betting legally so i am not saying it to it is justifying it but considering the circumstances there was even some high court judge told you make it legal and not because he has told and what is your opinion number 2 stock markets you are referring you are quite correct it is erecting i could quote a solid example when harshad mehta was there he was buying a ball bearing which is under bafr nobody knows what is a bafr and it's a sick company thing and ultimately you could have watched it is the psychology behind it so it is the shareholders or investors association they are educating people but more education is required from public so that they are not swindled thank you for the panel as far as the laws which are there in england and us are concerned which permit betting there are some basic minimal conditions which are observed but i must tell you that in india betting which has been investigated is far more complex it involves a large number of actors and sometimes they are even transnational actors and the amount of money uh, and it's very sad uh, to see that the game of cricket has finally been reduced to this that uh, that a person can actually underplay his ability for the purpose of money but the figures and the actual betting which takes place which uh, many police officers have told me in the course of investigation would be mind boggling so i don't think that in india this can be made legal it will lead to uh, worse than something like a single digit lottery you will have something which will destroy people and it will destroy homes uh, the second point which was made about the investments in the stock market i need to say that uh, with without meaning any disrespect the stock exchange board of india uh, has been a truly a stock exchange board of india which means it has been stocky and it has allowed whatever had to be exchanged which means it has been one of the most ineffective instruments and i do not think anybody knows about the number of cases which are compounded which are very serious violations and they're compounded for quietly for sums of money by the board or by the appellate tribunal i must also tell you that the number of financial foreign uh, institutional investors they call fiis uh, which mr venkat raman spoke about uh, they are foreign uh they are investors but there is nothing very institutional about them um and what they usually do is they have first class agents in the stock exchange and they will make a completely dud company and they will inject and ask the man to keep the price rising 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 till the indian investors get trapped and then the indian investors will sink in their hard earned money and then one fine morning that fii will be just gone so actually this happens all over the world but this happens more certainly in the indian stock market and i must tell you that notwithstanding kyc norms uh, it's very nice kyc but whatever be called kyc you can take it from me 
that we do have a fairly vulnerable system. And what has happened is that the stock market system has become a kind of a para-banking, almost government feels that sovereignty lies in the rising of sensex points rather than growth in the genuine sense, which is why GDP in real terms is actually quite poor in terms of marginal increase. Excuse me, sir. I am in the last row. My name is Ramesh. I represent the interest of Rajaji Center for Public Affairs. Well, I am of the opinion that uh, the stock market, as of now, especially in the SEBI regime, has become a casino. More particularly in the last 10 years or so, when uh, the so-called derivative trading have come to into the market, in which none of the investors have got any competence to handle. And I find from the reports that about 94 percentage of the uh, transactions that is taking place are all basically derivatives driven. That is, they are basically speculative in nature, which are not backed by any assets. And only about uh, 7 percentage of that, 6 or 7 percentage of the transactions are basically uh, cash transaction. That is delivery based. That is a person who buys shares, who will pay money and take the shares. So when that be the case, why is SEBI and the government put together want certain things to be put into our system which the people of India do not want, do not like and do not even know about it. And this is a casino which is building up, which is going to consume not only India but the whole of the world economy because similar things are available elsewhere also. When that be the case, when is SEBI going to wake up or who is going to wake them up and make this happen. Your impressions, Mr. Gopal? I must tell you uh, very quickly that uh, uh, I'm not an admirer of SEBI, and I think that this is a highly overestimated body. Um, it consists of, uh, shall we say, some gentlemen uh, who are posted by the government in the SEBI. Uh, the autonomy, which is meant to be exercised by a regulator, is only in form, it is not substantive, and I completely agree with you that this is a dangerous influx into the Indian stock market. And it's most unfortunate that, uh, uh, and I must tell you, that participatory notes were in fact withdrawn on account of my intervention a few years ago, uh, so also, Mr. Gurmukti, you would be happy to know about Hassan Ali, the UBS bank, its license to retail was also cancelled at my instance. But it was a letter which I wrote in 2010, but the license got cancelled uh, three years later. So my letter has effective response usually after three years. <laughs> I just like to comment one thing. I, I do not want to comment on the stockiness of SEBI or anything else. But the, the amazing part is how we lo look, and we include the government, look at the stock market as an indicator of our economy. And I have seen this, and this is completely wrong because that's not the correct e e indicator of how your economy is. But I have seen this, and Mr. Gurumuthi, with respect to you, whether it's a Congress or a BJP government, I have seen that when the stock market crashes, circulars are issued by whichever government is in power at that point in time that make the Mauritius Ruth sacrosanct to prevent the market crashing more. So I have seen this, that the way the government looks at it, if it's at 29,000, we should be doing well. If it's at 25,000, there's a problem. At 18,000, we'll panic and issue a circular. Just to add, when the SIT issued its second report, it clearly commented P notes generate black money, and this should be inquired. What was the result? Stock markets plummeted. FM had to make a statement, yes, we are aware of this, and the matter is under consideration. Stock market started shooting up. It's a powerful lobby. We must, and he, as he said, you can't shoot blindly. You need to architecture 
a very very powerful tool to handle this dinosaur sir sir a uh, few years back there was a proposal to abolish income tax and use those officers in central excise uh, do you think by doing that our uh, generation of white money will improve No, no, I, any, anyone can answer. I didn't want to answer this question because I was the proponent of this in 2001. It was actually accepted by the government. On the 19th of uh, January 2001, it was accepted by the government in the run-up to the budget that personal income tax should be completely dropped. The finance minister was not for it. But within six days, the Gujarat earthquake happened. So the finance minister came back and said, we need another 25,000, 30,000 crores for reconstruction, and so we can't afford it. That was the nearest point to which the a government came to drop the personal income tax. I am a believer that in India, there should be no personal income tax. There should be business tax. If a person carries on a business through a partnership or even through a sole proprietorship, he should be taxed. But otherwise, personal income tax should go because there is no social security in India. You take care of your parents, you take care of your elders, you educate your children. All the responsibilities is on the individual. So I believe there should be a re-look at the personal income tax regime. Whether it should be dropped or not, I don't know completely, but there is a need to revisit it. Sir, this is a quick line, uh, Mr. Rajagopalan, to what Mr. Guru Mukti said, that if all income tax officers uh, were transferred to the excise department, which is a very healthy suggestion, they would have a highly intoxicating income. <laughs> Sir, um, I have a great opportunity to hear the distinguishing speakers. Eh? And just uh, Mr. Justice Shri Krishna has said that the delays make the corruption. Now, uh, can Mr. Krishna will be in a position to apprise the Supreme Court of India or any courts of India to dispose of the matter earliest so that whatever the executive orders are there, they can be put to a restriction so that the corruption may be come out. And secondly, just Mr. Guru Murthy also declared that the, there is a uh, you can say personal tax should be wiped out. I feel so that high tax rate is the one of the criteria which is giving the uh, rise to the deep-rooted corruption to the public, uh, this uh, black money. So I would have to views of the um, Mr. Justice Krishna Murthy on this uh, aspect, ke whether uh, there should be an, uh, is, uh, you can say the earliest decision of the cases pending, so much pending in with different courts of the India, and uh, this uh, tax rate may be reduced to the minimum because even of the deposits or interest earned, the government gets most of the ten percent percentage to the uh, in, in the shape of the tax. So that leaves nothing to the a common public. Uh, your view, sir. Let's take it in the reverse direction. Uh, <coughs> as to the abolition of the personal income tax, I think uh, way back when the Satantra Party was alive. See, Raj Gopalachari was a big advocate. Palkiwala himself, on various public occasions, he said that it's high time that we give up this. Now, by transferring all the income tax officers to excise, are we going to solve the problem of corruption? I am not sure. It is just a question of tweedle dumb and tweedle dee. On the second issue, now on the next occasion when I meet the Chief Justice of India, I will put the idea to him, why don't you just dispose of all the matters? I had a very simple suggestion. Let's do one thing. All odd matters will be dismissed. So only the even matters will be there. Fifty percent of the local load is over. <laughs> or on Mondays we will dismiss only odd matters and Tuesdays we will dismiss even matters. That is also a good way of working. The arrears problem in the Supreme Court or any other high court or even the anyway subordinate judiciary is not a simple thing that you can wave a magic wand and solve it. We will solve it. Someday or the other it will be solved. As I said, I am only a plain citizen, I am no longer a judge. Sir, Mr. Gurmurthy, sir, there is a feeling that the black money concept arises because of lot of exemptions and subsections. So, 
what will happen if the government make compulsory for tax let it be lowest one person up to one lakh no tax after one lakh one person minimum level no exemption i think the black money concept may grow and the indian economy will grow if they invest in money in other property investment tax or asset tax like that if all the people are avoiding tax because of lot of exemptions and i'm sorry to say your people like auditor also giving lot of loopholes to find it <laughs> the possibilities i'm sorry please answer sir you need not feel sorry <laughs> because people come to auditors only to advise them on how to reduce taxation so long as the auditor gives legal advice he is not doing anything wrong see if you look at the budget documents 7 lakh crores is the amount which are lost in exemptions it is not only in income tax it is there in customs it is there in excise so in the year 2004 2005 if i remember right the prime minister and the finance minister said now that we have brought down the rates of taxation both the direct and indirect to such low levels there is no reason to continue these exemptions they openly announced it just before the budget everybody thought that there is going to be a huge rationalization of the exemptions in the budget nothing happened but somebody said this announcement itself was made so that sufficient number of people come and do whatever they need to do so that nothing needs to be done in the budget there is no case for exemption provisions in any of the enactments actually income tax exemption is about 100 no less than 100000 crores it is only excise and customs exemptions which are about uh, 6 lakh crores all these have to go every one of the exemption notification produces corruption and the law says this is the particular duty you have to pay but somebody goes and says for my industry or for my product it has to be less and this is not looked into by parliament some parliamentary committee may at some point of time look into so all the exemptions breed corruption i am of the view that the rates of duty being so low there is no reason except for example rice has to be given exemption nobody is going to bother about it life saving drugs are to be given exemptions nobody is going to bother about it but industrial products chemicals many things being given exemption is a source of corruption and all these exemptions have to go sir 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 sir, sir. sir. yeah i am balagopal and here <coughs> um i thought people would be talking about educational institutions here but uh, none had talked about it so i'd like to point my question to mr venget raman um 3 uh, or 4 years before i wanted to put my son in an engineering in, uh, college i had been to a famous college in chennai i don't want to name it here they said they gave me a small piece of paper they had done something with pencil they said you go to such and such building go and give the cash i said whom should i be meeting there no no give it to the security this paper he knows it and finally i decided not to put my son in that college and i put him in shastra university of course i'm not trying to um, promote the shastra university or anything but i was really uh, impressed by their approach so i put him there though my wife said no no you are trying to pull away my son from uh, me and you know you are uh, trying to save save some money i said that's not the intention it's the attitude so why, mr venkat raman how can we remove this educational institutions uh, taking so much money as uh, donations see if black can be converted into white by some white washing then it becomes a easy way to do it's not that simple Uh, as i said it's not education charity okay anything which has consumption a consumer base india capitalizes that consumer base to generate black money education is one such element charity is generate more than even education if you see statistically therefore i am happy at least you could find a security guard to give unlike uh, tamil films where you are uh, tied up and uh, taken to some remote forest and asked to put money in a pit you find out found out somebody but when it comes to yes yes dr vaidya was carried pride in saying that we don't have a problem fighting against a current requires grit and courage more than that you must believe in divinity that's the difference Uh, sir, I need to add, sir, good evening. I, sorry, I just needed to add one thing to what Mr. Venkatraman said. 
I think one of the important areas about educational institutions is the process of approval and affiliation and the kind of money which they engender from the regulator and the universities. It is unspeakable, it is unthinkable, it is unstatable. And I'm telling you that I find it completely impossible to believe that you have what are called inspectors or assessors who are supposed to be very eminent doctors. I don't know how eminent these doctors are. But I find that these doctors find five doctors fake on day one. After one week, they find them genuine. And after another seven days, they find three are fake. If someone can explain this facet of medicine, I'll be delighted. But that is a medical council for India. Sir, this is John Morris. Just one last question. Sir, that is not restricted to medical practice. You know what happened to uh, uh, law colleges being approved. Same thing happened. Sir. Bar council members go and I convicted two of them in the Supreme Court. And I said these fellows should be flogged in public in addition to being put in jail. Nothing happened. Good evening, sir. Sir, this is in regard with the Companies Act amendment. There is an amendment in the Companies Act in regard with the political contribution. Previously, the political contribution in the Companies Act was restricted to 5 percentage. Now, it has been enhanced to 7.5 percentage, which has never been spoken in any media. It has never been talked at all. But there is a malicious increase from 5 percentage of the net profit to 7.5 percent net profit, which has never been spoken of. This is one question. The second question is Foreign Contribution Regulation Act. Is it really active? Foreign hospitality is applicable for the office bearers also in regard to the political parties. Suddenly a mother, suddenly a son disappears from India, they go to foreign countries, rest, stress, they go out of India and they come back to India. Are they reporting in regard to the Foreign Contribution Regulation Act? Are they monitored in regard to the foreign hospitality? Is it really active in India? See, in this amnesty scheme, you will be surprised. Honest failure of disclosure alone was disclosed. Honest. They failed to disclose in the past. They used this as an occasion to disclose. Nobody else came forward for two strong reasons. It's a package. If you want to grant an amnesty, you must grant immunity. You must grant confidentiality. This scheme did not have these two things. And therefore, they could not go beyond 4,000 crores. When it comes to the act which you mentioned for, for, for the charity purposes, see, legislations are also a tool or a medium to, to pedal. That's all very insignificant. We were all discussing the larger picture of how to find out an architecture to fight this monster. That's the point. That, that is something, in fact, uh, I think both SG sir and myself, we will request one to Mr. Gurumuthi sir because he, he's, he, he has a say in the governing uh, body of uh, India today. We, we, all, that, all that we need to, we, we need to aspire, aspire is how to encourage, how to encourage people from the thought process of dissuading yourself to be committing yourself to the crime of a black money. This is something, it, it's education, sustained education yields results. You can't cleanse it in two years. You can't cleanse it in five. He says, yes, that, fine. But a longer jurisdiction, a gestation period of education will turn around India into a non-generating economy. The problem is not anything else. The attitude to generate should reduce. And the attitude, today you're talking of laundering of money coming into India. You don't have, you don't use the sluice gates properly for the money which goes out of India. You are talking of capturing it as it returns, capturing as it stays, but not as it goes out. These are the two areas which needs certainly a concentrated effort. It's my feel. Yes, Mr. My don't, name is Ravi Shankar. No. One minute. Don't build my brand as a supporter of the government. <laughs> I am a sentinel on this government. I have written strongly about the wrong things this government does also. Just the last comment, I think, whether it's an exemption provision, whether it's a charity provision, any transaction that is not taxed is used today to convert black into white. But again, that is a symptom. I do believe that today, when we have tax rates of 30% or 
in a country that has is relatively poor and if we keep in mind 1970 when the tax rate was 97.5 percent today I know nobody likes paying tax whether it's a salary person or the business person but I believe at 30 percent it's a fair share of the burden if you will see the developed world whether it's Sweden or Norway it's 66 percent of course they get services for that 66 percent we get perhaps scams but still 30 percent I think is a cost that we should be willing to bear considering the poverty levels that we have and I think it's time that we change our attitude. Okay. So my name is Ravi Shankar. No, I, I no, think please. time please. is really run out. Uh, so I think I'll just uh, conclude, you know. One last few, question, sir. I think, uh, please, if you yeah, don't sure. mind. Thank you. I agree. You know, I think we've had a very interesting uh, discussion here with lots of points that have come out. Uh, what is clear is that the black economy and this illegality affects every sector of the economy, whether it's the judiciary or the education sector or the medical sector, government, businesses and so on. So what we need to do is take an overview of the situation. We won't find solutions individually in each sector. We'd find only solutions that really are overall. One thing I'd like to say is that the system understands what is going on. So knowledge is private but not public. For instance, the Hawala houses, where the Hawala operates from, they are tracked by the intelligence agencies. It is known in Delhi where the Hawala operates from, in uh, Kolkata or in Bombay, etc. So if the system really wanted to check it, Hawala could be stopped very quickly. It doesn't take a long time for the government to st stop Hawala immediately. Secondly, this HSBC case, it is clear that India's private banks have been operating as Hawala operators, multinational banks as well as Indian private banks. Uh, in the case of HSBC, the d data has come out already. In the case of LGT Bank, also the data has come out. But what is clear is that banking secrecy has come in the way of this uh, checking of the Hawala that takes place through the banking system. Similarly, NTRO, the telecom agencies, uh, taps 7.5 lakh telephones every year. You know, the Radia tapes case is before us. We know what is going on, what are the kind of conversations that go on. Government has information, vast amount of information, but it's not acted on. But what is done is that that information is used to blackmail other political parties. I think that's clear that information exists, but it's not used. So I think the pressure has to come from the public. As long as we have examples of uh, a certain chief minister who got caught in a case, and then he made his wife the chief minister, and then she, the wife wins the elections, then the message to the politicians is that we can do what we like, but we can come back to power, and therefore we are not accountable. So there are any number of examples, if you look at uh, Punjab, one party comes, arrest the previous chief minister, the other party comes and arrest the chief minister, same way in Tamil Nadu. So you know, all political parties are involved, so they are not going to put a check on themselves. So unless public pressure comes, and that is what I think is important, how to build the public pressure and that would require movements. Unless movements take place and we could see the recent Ramdev and Anna Hazare movement as it grew, uh, the government was quaking and that's why when uh, Ramdev came to the airport, four cabinet ministers, uh, cabinet secretary, four secretaries to government of India went to receive him, whereas even a foreign dignitary is not received by more than one minister. So in other words, public pressure is absolutely crucial and without that it would not happen. That's how other countries have solved the problem. For instance, in Sweden, as the example was given, the tax rate is high, but the black economy size is only 1 to 2 percent of GDP. Similarly, in New Zealand, similarly in many other countries. So it's not really whether we can change tax rates, whether we can change laws, etc. It is that whatever we have, is there public pressure, which will then make the implementation feasible. Because implementation, if it is not there, as the panelists have repeatedly said, then it won't matter whatever laws you have. So we've had, for instance, the double taxation avoidance agreement since 1990. But there's not been one case that has been honored because of the double taxation avoidance agreement. And the reason is very clear. The double taxation avoidance agreement is about white incomes which are declared and which would not be taxed in both places rather than the black incomes which are not declared. Similarly, the tax information exchange treaty is about the declared income, but if the income is not declared, then it would not apply in those cases also. So the public pressure is needed here in India. If the public pressure builds up, then the money that's going abroad, that would be stopped because that is only dependent on the black income generated here. So if black income generation here is stopped, money going abroad would be also slowed down or stopped, 
then only we'll be, be able to deal with the particular topic that we have here. And with that, I'd like to thank the organizers. I'd like to thank the panelists. Everybody is kept to time, and that's why we are able to keep to time also. So thanks to everybody, thanks to the audience, and I pass you on to the uh, organizers. Thank you. Having discussed so much on unaccounted currencies, I confess we are guilty of producing and circulating our own very special type of currency without paying tax. Gratitude. Gratitude is a currency that we can mint for ourselves and spend without fear of bankruptcy. On that note, I now call upon Mr. Anand Murthy, Vice President of Times of India, to deliver the vote of thanks. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I wish the evening had continued and we could have uh, much more time. Uh, today, I must confess that at a personal level, the amount of information which I have gathered uh, could only make me better, both at a personal level as well as a uh, somewhere down the line, professionally as well. On a lighter note, I always used to wonder why the laundry machine sells so brilliantly in India. Uh, today, I think uh, the eminent panelists have actually answered that big puzzle. And no wonder so many MNCs are rushing in into India. But I must uh, confess that uh, while the evening is ending, it is uh, Shastra University, the school of law, which has chosen such a delightful subject, which actually ensured that all of us gather the pearls of wisdom. Uh, I don't think we would have seen such eminent panelists, such knowledge which has been acquired over a huge amount of time and experience. Because uh, whatever today we heard is all from personal wisdom, many places, and uh, many of them are practicing. And I think we should all be grateful. And on behalf of Times of India, I'm extremely happy that we were associated and we had the privilege of doing it. I don't know, many of you would have read uh, behind, just below the logo, there is this three or four words which says, let the truth prevail. I think Indians have to wait a little longer. The citizens woke some time and then went back into slumber. But I'm so confident by seeing the Anna Hazare moment, where common people for the first time felt that they could be part of change. And I think that is the awakening which will actually bring change at the grassroots level because all of us are educated and all of us can do hundreds of things by paying black money and still surviving. I was just thinking about a poor farmer who has no idea how to survive. Uh, and it, it pervades into every aspect of his life. Somewhere all of us need to actually get up and say enough. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you for all of you for being here. I think it's been a delightful evening. Thank you. May I now request the audience to rise for the national anthem, please. Janagana mana dinayaka jayahe Bharat Bhagya Vidata Punjab Sindh Gujarat Maratha Dravid Utkala Banga Vindhya Himachala Yamuna Ganga Utchala Jaladita Ranga Tava Shubha Nami Jage Tava Shubha Shisha Mage Gahe Tava Jaya Gata Janagana Mangal Daya Kajaya He Bharat Bhag Vidata Jaya He Jaya He Jaya He Jaya 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 He Thank you and safe departures. <laughs>